Ah, <sighs> great. Managed to make it here before anyone else shows up. Um, all right. Well, hang on. Let us. Let me give it a second. Bum, bum, bum. Mm, mm, mm. Okay. Well, I'm just going to start presenting this because. So the general idea. The general idea here is that oh, bollocks. There we go. Okay. So. Uh, uh, change window, blah, blah, blah. Here we go. So, uh, I made, I, when I was doing my master's here in Leiden, um, I did my degree in something called crisis and security management. And so it's, it's really like this quite big, wanky bureaucrat preparedness course. Uh, so you, you do a bit on how to handle disasters, how, how crises emerge and how management takes care of them. And then a lot of stuff on things like border control, policing, uh, cybersecurity, violent crime, uh, terrorism, so on and so forth. And so I did my, I did my thesis on drug prohibition, which is, as it turns out, it turned out to be a much hairier topic than I thought it was. Now, initially I was going to do something about the longevity of unrecognized states, but that involved using um, a statistical instrument that I wasn't too sort of comfortable with. And I had to eventually bin it um, and do this. So I'm just going to start by reading the um I'm just going to start by reading the uh abstract over here and then I'm going to read only a couple of sections. I mean I won't take you through the boring shit of like the 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 literature review and things like that except maybe for a couple of points that I think will be interesting. Um but yeah so abstract is the thesis is a comparative analysis of the reasons for the differences in success of the drug prohibition policies of Japan and England and Wales. Now, if you're wondering why I'm doing England and Wales, it's, it's very irritating. So Scotland has a devolved government. And so you can't really take the UK as a whole for its drug policy. And then England and Wales, for some reason, it's together. So, I mean, the UK is a mess. Mm. So these countries are both large, highly developed island nations with histories of overseas colonial expansion, parliamentary liberal democracies, constitutional monarchy, and ministerial civil services. Their drug policies, while using very similar laws, are vastly different in outcome. I'll attempt to explain the differences in the extent of drug use in terms of situational action theory adapted to a national scale. This is achieved through a historical institutional analysis supported by a comprehensive survey of the available national, nationwide statistical indicators, creating a thick description of the policy environment affecting each variable. So that's a very wanky way of going on about it. But basically, the what I'm what I'm basically going on is saying that so these two countries are as similar as I could get them while having as different outcomes as I could get them. And everyone will say, oh yeah, yeah, but the culture is different. I'm getting there. Um, so basically the question that's behind this whole thesis was that, uh, was, you know, uh, does, is, is strictness of enforcement of drug policy, do, does it improve, is, can, can that explain, um, you know, the differences in outcomes between England and Japan? And I, I thought they did. Uh, but I should say before I go into this, that before I wrote this thesis, I actually thought that um, drug liberalization was a good idea. Now, I'd already sort of come to terms with the fact that maybe doing a lot of drugs, even psychedelic drugs, was not a good thing, despite what we all believe in undergrad um, as humanities students, you know, the party lifestyle being what it is. But... Um, you know, I, I I still thought that it was actually silly to enforce these laws, and um, and then I came across Peter Hitchens ha ha having an argument about this, and I thought, well, that's pretty strange. Who develops? Who defends? Dr uh, you know, uh, um, drug prohibition these days. Everyone realizes it's silly, 
Then I read his book and I realized he has some very, very interesting arguments. Essentially what he was saying is that um, drug policy um, has not been enforced and the war on drugs is a complete misnomer. There hasn't been a war on drugs, at least not in England anyway. Now, there's a whole other story with America that America is very, very complicated. And I think that people should be a little bit more circumspect about how they talk about American policies in any sphere, because it's a very complicated country. But um, as far as, in, as the UK goes, Peter Hitchens really had a point. And the only problem with that is it's not an academic text. It's a journalist's book. And he's got some citations in there that you can use, but, you know. So I, I tried to find anyone who'd actually addressed his thesis at all. And I could literally only find one. So I wrote this in the I wrote this in the acknowledgement. So I said I'd like to thank my supervisor, Professor Yuri Mateis, for helping to clear up certain conceptual ambiguities in my articulation of my thesis. I'd also like to thank Dr. David Brewster. Now here's the fella for directing me to official resources for this ja for the Japanese statistics. Their websites are not always intuitive to navigate. Finally, I would like to acknowledge an author whose work could not be directly used as an, as an authority, not being an official source or an academic, but who nevertheless had a powerful impact effect on the direction this paper took, that being the British journalist Peter Hitchens, whose work, The War We Never Fought, pursues an argument which this thesis confirms. It was out of reaction and an attempt to refute his argument that I began this investigation. Dr. David Brewster's response to Hitchens, including a criticism of Japanese statistical sources, and an appreciation of the cultural element shaped the data-guided, morally-framed approach that I eventually took. So, let's just get into it. I'm going to read you some sections, starting with the introduction. Um, I won't read you the whole bloody thing, because it's just incredibly long. Um, but uh, let's just start here. Broadly speaking, there are two major philosophies of drug control today. The conservative view sees drug taking as morally wrong and seeks to suppress it by reinforcing social norms against it through education and legal deterrence. The liberal approach considers criminal punishment to be a harm and whether because of the belief that drug taking is a personal choice or as a result of a weighing of perceived harms encourages the use of non-coercive means to counter the harms of drug use. While some strategies of each approach can work together, the use of many key harm reduction policies for minimizing the secondary harms may facilitate the spread of drug abuse. And while the deterrence strategies for deterring usage may exacerbate secondary harms like disease. The perennial call to evidence-based policy is not value-free, which trade-offs are worth making is a matter of moral perspective. The law and morality are coextensive, and to a greater or lesser extent, one reflects and influences the other. As John Braithwaite famously argued, the law does not function without its denunciatory element. That is, you know, it doesn't function if the punishment isn't real. By compromising on uh, the moral vision which underpins the prohibition of drugs, and by weakening the deterrent function of the law, many Western nations have weakened their capacity to prohibit illegal drugs. I don't know why I'm doing this. I'm not hearing anything. Uh, there are countries in the Far East, however, without this characteristic. So the question is, why are some countries, given similar governing capacities, more successful at drug prohibition than others? This paper compares England and Wales to Japan. They have very similar laws on the books regarding illegal drugs, but a reputation for vastly different outcomes. Japan has much lower rates of drug abuse, and I treat drug abuse quite simply as a crime, which it is in both countries. According to situational action theory, the causes of crime are a matter of several variables, of which three temptation, which is the desire or availability of opportunity to commit a certain offence, deterrence, which is coercive disincentives to commit a certain offence, so, you know, police coming and locking you up, and law-relevant morality, that is, the belief that it is morally wrong to commit a certain offence. So, law, you know, what you believe is right and wrong and how it aligns with the law. So these are measurable at a national scale and are affected by state policy. Because most statistical indicators have come under individual scrutiny, I'll be using a comprehensive survey of the publicly available cognate nationwide statistical indicators to establish the degree to which drug abuse is present in society and the extent of the independent variables indicated by situational action theory.
These include arrest and prosecution rates, public surveys on usage, morality, and availability, drug seizure volumes, HIV infection rates, hospitalization rates, and overdose deaths. Combined with a qualitative analysis of national institutions, this theoretical framework and body of evidence is employed to determine the reasons for the differences in outcome between Japan and England and Wales. So, I mean, I, I, I scrubbed through a whole bunch of things. And so basically the Japanese government and the British government make a whole bunch of uh, statistics available to the public. Not all of them match up. So I only took the things for the years that, you know, I could compare. Um, but it's like a whole bunch of different things that I took. So it's like, you know, police arrest rates, prosecution rates. Um, uh Ooh, what else did I take? Uh, like hospital admission records, HIV infection rates um, due to um, due to injection of drugs, all of these kind of things. So there's also the discussion of like how these different uh, things, uh, how these different statistics are acquired um, and what they mean in the context because all institutions are kind of different. Because remember, I mean, like you're used to reading, you're used to reading these statistics from like, oh, so and so country has this and this and this. But usually, if you go into it and you dig into the statistics, you realize that everything is much more complicated. And I think a lot of people who've been diving into the epidemiological stuff now um, with COVID have kind of seen this. That when you when you look at how various things are measured very closely, you'll realize that numbers don't really sort of speak for themselves. Or as my um, lecturer once said, facts don't speak for themselves, you know. So you really do need to look into things a little bit. So I, I try to be quite comprehensive with this. Obviously, it's a bloody academic paper, so you have to be as part of the course. So, but I mean, yeah. So I have to argue on the academic. The thing is, you have to argue why this thing is important. So over here, you'll see, you know, um, but I think this is important because it'll give you a flavor of, uh, of what I'm up against. You know, so it says, I have identified several gaps in the literature on drug policy. This is you, when you be polite in, 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 in academia. So you don't say, oh, everybody's like barking up the wrong tree. They're all being retarded. You say, no, um, I have identified several gaps in the literature. Anyway, so firstly, there are a few extant comparisons of East and West. That means that nobody is compared. And I'm serious. This is literally, I shit you not, if you can believe that now at this stage, this is the first actual systematic comparison of an Eastern and Western country on their drug policy. Blows my mind. I can't believe it because it's so obvious. If you want to see, you know, whether it works or not, you actually compare places where it has worked and where it hasn't worked and see why. But no one bothers to do this, you know. The literature is dominated by Western countries and often compares small nation states to the highly pluralistic continental-sized federal entity of the United States. The drug prohibition policies of East Asia are understudied in general, and the Northeast Asian democracies in particular, Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan, which present unique cases of strict adherence to the spirit of the 1961 Single Convention on Narcotic Drugs. While the Far East remains strict, governing bodies within the pluralist liberal West have deviated from the spirit of the Prohibitionist Convention. In many countries, even the United States, with its reputation for excessive punishment, the law is enforced asymmetrically across and within jurisdictions, creating a conflict of lenient and punitive strategies, leading to paradoxical outcomes. This difference between the laws on the books and the laws on the street is not always addressed, this has contributed to a popular narrative that the war on drugs has been strictly and seriously enforced, but has failed because of some inherent feature of human nature. However, in the West, selective enforcement of the law and the de facto legalization at the state or nation level has been policy for more than a generation. While no state has so far entirely legalized narcotics from lab to lip, Portugal has decriminalized possession of all drugs. Personal possession, I should have qualified their personal possession. Um, this, while hailed as revolutionary, is in fact a codification of its long-standing prior de facto policy, a strategy partially adopted by the Netherlands until 1995. So Portugal basically uh, in 1975, um, the, the socialists came to power and they just stopped enforcing the law on drug enforcement almost completely. And, you know, abuse of drugs skyrocketed. 
And then in around in the late 90s, they decided they needed to do something. So they created a whole bunch of interventions where they forced people under threat of fines and various things um, into drug treatment programs um, and scrapped the laws that were on the book that they had not actually been enforcing and increased pressure on drug trafficking. So actually enforcement increased, but they tell everyone that they abolished drug enforcement. It's right. So the whole discussion around this is completely retarded. So um, the U uh, I mean, the Netherlands also just kind of stopped enforcing its law for huge swathes of uh, categories of drugs. And I, I should read that. Uh, I'll, I'll maybe maybe another time I'll read off. I did a did a policy history on the Netherlands and South Korea as well, and of and of uh, Sweden. But that's kind of for another time. For now, I'm I'm just going to focus on 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 this stuff, which is the UK and Thingamabob, uh, Japan. So the UK adjusted its sentencing recommendations to depenalize possession in 1971. Ignorance of these developments has allowed those who advocate for full legalization to claim that prohibition cannot work. The absence of comparisons with the Far East may well contribute to this narrative. Furthermore, morality is seldom mentioned, not just here, but across the social sciences. Prevailing moral attitudes are not ancillary to social science, they are central. And as I hope to demonstrate, these faults are interrelated. Moral attitudes not only affect individuals' likelihood of engaging in certain acts, but shape the social pressures which guide them. The West has been debating drug policy for decades, and this debate has far-reaching consequences. Many powerful institutions today push for the legalization of various narcotics, particularly cannabis, which is often treated as harmless or even a panacea. The hard drugs, the harms of hard drugs are widely known, but while they are widely thought to carry fewer risks, the use of psychedelics or soft drugs is not without danger. Now, here, I really, really was very careful not to state too boldly because you have to understand the burden of proof that you have to sort of demonstrate in academia to say things that are against the grain. So I had to be very circumspect. So just die if you want to see if you want to think how 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 i believe this goes just dial it up to 11. um contrary to prevailing liberal attitudes there is a significant there's significant evidence that cannabis is indeed a gateway drug as well as a potential teratogen that means it causes uh, deformities in unborn children and risks causing permanent psychosis yeah it really fucking does and these effects have long been dismissed as scare tactics, but the medical community is far from considering such drugs harmless. Taking these facts into account, the deficit in the academic literature deserves to be taken seriously. I believe that this small study, which addresses these four aforementioned gaps, will be of some bloody, bloody, blah, blah, useful, blah. And I really, one day, I'd love to give these guys have a fantastic thesis. Uh, Hitler and Basie, they talk about the decline of. Uh, the study of morality in the social sciences, um, which is fucking incredible. Um, and if you are interested in Portugal, that lady, I can't remember what her first name is, but Lecure, she did a really, really good thing on um, on Portugal. Anyway, so lit review. So legal, th this is basically sort of talking about... Um, Trying to say, you know, trying to, if you're not an academic, a literature review is um, the section where basically you go through everything that everyone has said about the topic. And, well, I mean, obviously it's impossible to get everyone, but you're trying to get all of the big conversations and say, this is what everyone is saying about all these different topics. You summarize it and you say, this is what is said. Right, and you can be a little bit critical and so on at, at points, but really you're just trying to summarize, summarize the conversation that has gone before you, and demonstrating. Okay, so this is where everything sits, and then you go. Right, if you're all university educated, then you'll know this, and it's not impressive. But I just thought I'd mention it for anyone who isn't. It's not fancy, but it's a really good idea, um, and I like it. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I'm not too radical on 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 you know, academic culture. Um, I just think it's been corrupted, but that's a different story, a different conversation for a different time. <sighs> but, 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 let's see, how much of this can I skip and what can I introduce? Um, so um, 
I, I'm the I'm going to skip the, the the theory thing, and I'm just going to talk about a little bit of um, a little bit of empirical study. Um, and say, for most corporations, instilling an internal ethic of legal compliance. Actually, no, bugger that. Let's skip this bit. Um, uh, so, uh, actually, I'll do this, but this paragraph is, is, is fairly important. Several high-profile studies show severity of punishment generally does not correlate well with compliance, but perceived per certainty of punishment does. Confirmation comes from studies which show that general increase in uh, show that increased general security measures related to terrorism reduce all forms of crime. But empirical studies into whether specific enforcement results in compliance with specific interventions is uncommon and can be summarized fairly briefly. In general, punishment of transgression is important for achieving group cooperation. Citation. Uh, regarding alcohol, the verdict is clear, whether relating to drunk driving or underage purchase. Stricter enforcement is positively correlated with compliance. The same applies to seatbelt wearing while driving. And I think um, I think in a different version, I included uh, something on uh, either, either under this citation or I'm not sure. Let's see, 35. I might have included under 35 there on smoking, but it's true that basically if you, suppression suppresses, I think would be the summary of that little section, which is um, um, it's a general thing. I mean, th th there's something that we're generally taught to think of in society, which is if you, if you oppress people and you suppress their behavior, that there'll be a response. Not true. If you consistently and effectively enforce um, a certain moral code or code of behavior, uh, people comply the more strictly and evenly you enforce it. So if your enforcement capacity is low, then you get rebellion. Or if you show weakness, then think it's it's a lot like the psychology of um, it's a lot like the psychology of abuse. If your uh, if your abuser is very uh, dominating and does not show weakness ever, they will comprehensively subdue you. But if you're um, if they show weakness, then um, then there's usually an opportunity for psychologically escaping the trap. At any rate, this is I'm going way off topic here. Uh, drug prohibition. Uh, so the reason this thing is essential concept in macro um, macro drug policy is that there's there's a lot of weird ideas like um, you know laws like here we go the law on the book and the law, the laws on the books and the law in practice which I highlighted in the in the introduction as well which is that you know you get um, you, you you get you get states which have law you know laws they don't enforce and look for a South African that's fairly transparent stuff. I mean, you've got plenty of laws in the book that don't get enforced, but that's not as a matter of policy. Some some states just choose wholeheartedly not to enforce whole sections of law, which is very, very bizarre. And it's a very European thing to do as well. Um, but I, but here's the, the, there's an interesting bit on um, the scope of drug prohibition. So at least formally speaking, it's universal. All states have laws on the books prohibiting consumption, possession, trade, or manufacture of several categories of intoxicating substance. This is true. It's global. The 1961 single convention uh, reiterated in the UN General Assembly special session in 1998 sought to attain a drug-free world, largely under pressure from the United States. However, legislators in both political entities recognize that this is not absolutely achievable. The aim is to reduce drug consumption to a practical minimum. The current treaties do not mandate a specific policy, except that sanctions of some kind must be placed on the possession of drugs. And the UN currently prescribes abandoning criminal penalties for possession. This allows a lot of leeway for signatories, and the degree and manner of enforcement can vary considerably. So, um, and then here's the thing, the retreat of the United States as an agenda-setting power of the policy are uh, arena has opened the way for a liberal turn driven by Western Europe and the um, and South America, as it turns out, who uh, originated the Global Commission on Drug Policy in 2011. So, um, and that's mostly resisted by Asia. Asia doesn't doesn't like this stuff. They um, they're very big on enforcing the law. Of course, they don't study China because China's opaque. No one knows what the hell's going on in there. They lie all the time, so their statistics can't be trusted. 
I mean, it's not like the United States where if they're lying in statistics, you can actually see the precise way in which they're lying because their, st their institutions are fairly open. Uh, it's totally different in China. You know, it's, it's almost impossible to know what's going on there in many, many different spheres. Very, very opaque country. So, um, uh, yeah, we talk about things being more and more or less punitive. Um, let's see, what do we got here? How much can I skip here? I'm going to skip this. Um, ah, here we go. The Holzmann Commission in the Netherlands in 1971. Oof. Uh, that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cover that some other time and do something on the history of the policy in Netherlands because that's just a wild story. So, um, yeah, because yeah, it, it based, yeah, well, here we go, the Holzmann Report, which created the first model, modern scheduling distinction. So scheduling is when different drugs are rated like you, this one's a, a class A, class B, class C, if you're in the, the United Kingdom, or hard and soft, if you're in the, in, if you're in the Netherlands. Um, and all drugs are given like different schedules, and that means you, they're punished differently. They have different strategies attached to them. Okay. So... Uh, the, yeah, the Holzmann report uh, sort of, uh, you know, created that uh, scheduling distinction. But actually, I mean, it, it, the, the first time it was made in um, in any policy document was, of course, in the in Egypt um, when it was under the British colony. Uh, that'll be touched on later. Anyway, so then I, I, I point out here, of course, that tobacco and alcohol are drugs. And uh, they're, while being not being thought of as being drugs because of their traditional legal status, alcohol has in the past been treated in the same way and is widely recognized as one of the most harmful of intoxicants. The standard argument against prohibition often generalizes across categories of chemical dependency, which is that people say, alcohol, the alcohol prohibition didn't work, so why do you think drug prohibition will work? Yeah, let's not get ahead of ourselves. So... There's indeed support from the field of epidemiology that the division between alcohol and tobacco and other chemical properties is an arbitrary one. But considering that all other repressive policies, when, whether in the form of taxation, zoning, licensing, hours, or advertising bans, have generally shown to result in a reduction in the consumption of alcohol and tobacco and their attendant harms, to point out continuity is to suggest an argument for the suppression of addictive substances in general. Right? So... I'm basically saying that the more you repress these things, the more they're repressed, and they ought to be repressed. Historical analyses of the effects of the enforcement of drug uh, of alcohol prohibition, both in the United States and in Northern Europe, shows that it had the effect of significantly reducing consumption, though there is some dispute as to what extent this is the result of enforcement or social pressure. So the reason I say that is because there was a the, the prohibition movement was a result of a large popular movement, largely led by housewives and churches and big grassroots thing that consumed most of the heartland of America and pressured for um, prohibition laws and the help of the the, um, the government to suppress the, the rampant drinking culture which destroyed families and so on and communities. So they intervene and they basically suppress the, you know, there's still a few dry counties left um, in the United States these, these days, but they're not very many of them. Although if anyone's not, everyone knows the one where Jack Daniels is brewed in a place that is still a dry county. Um, but largely, is it. but the thing is that in the United States, they didn't ban personal possession of alcohol. So they banned like the trafficking of it, but you could like keep your own personal stash of alcohol in the house. Uh, and the doctors would prescribe you alcohol for various kind of nervous disorders and shit. So basically... People could still drink, find ways of getting to drink, and the laws were largely, a f uh, in many places, they acted as um, not much more than a fig leaf. And so because the demand was still there, the supply was created elsewhere. So they really only, yeah, it's complicated. So they there were problems cr created as a result from incomplete enforcement. So, But in general, the researchers... Uh, because uh, it wasn't only the United States, also Russia and Scandinavia banned alcohol. Uh, the, the literature shows that it had the effect of significantly reducing consumption, though there is some dispute as to what extent this result in force with social pressure. In general, these researchers use data from liver cirrhosis patients, arrests, and seizures as their main indicators. Such are not available for most of Russia's Soviet era. Yeah, because the second they realized they needed revenue for alcohol, they just kind of turned on the taps. 
and drowned their people in cheap vodka. Um, but its different periods of suppression through tax and prohibition showed a dramatic positive effect on alcohol mortality when employed. The Soviet regime, which soon found alcohol to be a rich source of state revenue, abandoning its earlier position of total prohibition gradually through the 20s, eventually introduced state-backed alcohol production. They subsequently suppressed figures on indicators of alcohol consumption until the 1980s. Glasnost, etc. <sighs> yeah, no. Um, I mean, here's the other thing: is that so? There's there's another argument that comes up in 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 drug prohibition. They say, oh, well, you know, people need their intoxicants. So if you take away the one drug, they'll just replace it with another. Bullshit. The reason it's bullshit is that English people and Japanese people drink the same amount of alcohol, almost identically, and in very similar patterns. There's a lot of binge drinking, and there's a lot of chronic alcoholism, and um, yeah, they consume roughly the same per capita, you know, um, give or take a few percentage points. Like, you know, it's within the, the, the sort of realm of deviation, standard deviation. It's a, um, so there appears for many reasons, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, and then I say all of that here. So evidence suggests that uh, many people uh, will substitute drug consumption for alcohol consumption. Though the fact that the heaviest drinkers are Northern Europeans, with the Japanese at a similar level, appears to have more to do with drinking norms than some baseline need, human need for inebriation. This is especially plainly indicated by certain statistics of Sweden leading up to their strict rationing policy. Yeah, actually what they did is they tracked and traced every single um, uh, citizen, and your local council rationed your alcohol, so you could only have like a few liters a, a month. And if you misbehaved or were weird, they just take your alcohol away. And uh, yep, that was it. And it was per household. And if anyone in the household was misbehaving for whatever reason, they just take your alcohol away. So uh, yeah, pretty invasive. But you know, most of society went dry as social uh, pressure built up. And like, it was, it was pretty mad. At one point, it was like 93% of all of their, um, their elected representatives were teetotalers. So pretty, pretty, um, pretty crazy. So, I mean, one of the things that I thought was necessary is to look at the fact that there is to look again at this whole thing of like culture being different. So I quoted this fella, um, and there's another quote that's much better, that, that's, that's really, really great from the same sort of introductory chapter from this book. Um, but it's, it's excellent. Um, the, the, the fella's called, uh, Curtis, uh, called so something Curtis. I can't remember his bloody first name, but he wrote a book on the political culture of Japan. And then he says this, um, uh, Japan in this century has experienced militarism and pacifism, authoritarianism and democracy. There was a two-party system in the 1920s, a coalition government for 10 years after the war, one party dominance for nearly 40 years, and a coalition government again in the 90s. There have been times in Japan's modern political history marked by harmony and social peace, and periods where instability and conflict predominated. One of the standard Western language works about Japanese politics in the 1930s was titled Government by Assassination. Although Japanese place a high value on consensus building, the spirit of harmony, called wa no seishin, and the avoidance of overt conflict, modern Japanese history is replete with intrigue, violence, and radical change. Culture cannot explain these variations unless one so devalues the concept that it stands for nothing more than whatever surfaces the dominant pattern of social interaction at any particular point in time. Right. Considering all of this, it seems wise to avoid abstract theoretical models of culture and better to focus on tangible elements. For example, the adversarial British common law system versus the semi-inquisitorial Japanese civil law system. So, I mean, this is the thing. If you want to talk about culture, what is culture? It's learned behavior. Um, and then you've got to just identify actual behaviors. And in the institutions, it gives you generalized laws that are very sort of broadly recognized. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and then I'll talk about how each state, like, tries to follow their targets and things like that, how the UN mentions this kind of stuff. And then I talk about, like, how big the studies are on international comparisons, which is boring, measuring drug use. Um, I was talking about the problems with, like, survey data, which... 
uh, and then why why you know some countries are too complex to read or anything it's talking about uh, uh hiv oh here's an interesting one several authors have remarked on the complexity of drug market prices as an outcomes indicator so basically they're saying if you want to see whether your policy is working well or not you um you say is it pushing the prices of drugs higher because if you're making it harder to access and the prices go up if you suppress the supply side then the then the price tends to go down because yeah anyway um uh freeborn found a negative significant relationship between delay enforcement and pure gram price and a positive significant relationship between consumer enforcement and pure gram price right so you get when you enforce uh, when you enforce the policies on the dealers, then it depresses the price because the 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 risk that the risk is on the dealer, and they have to be they're more desperate for customers. Um, if you if you depress if you go after the the consumers of the drugs, then it drives up the price um, because the advantage goes to the dealer in the market. Right, that's what that's about. Um, Price estimates vary for a number of reasons. So while high drug prices are often taken as a market success in um, in suppression, it's seen as senior researchers as an extremely slippery metric. So basically, um, you have to be careful with trying to uh, trying to draw direct comparisons um, because I mean, like I include this in it's it's one of the indicators that I'm using later. But I'm pointing out here that it's it's very slippery, and so drawing direct comparisons. Um, over time is very difficult. Um, unless the, you have to sort of try and have as many sort of uh, variables in common to have uh, a similar thing. So I said the UN, uh, so this little quote here is very important, is, is hilarious because it says like the UN figure is uh, for estimating the, um, like how big the, the, the illicit trade is internationally is it's ridiculous because they don't take um it's not it's not like they they're they're trying to say how much drugs are trafficked so when you go to the un and you look for the statistics most of their shit is guesswork unless you the, the only statistics you can trust are ones where you say well this is how many cases are observed right and then you say well if we recreate the the institutional conditions for that elsewhere and the numbers change then we know it's a different result Right. But what the UN does is they sort of like, well, they'll pick one institutional context at random or depending on what they want. And then they'll pretend that they can extrapolate from that based on some assumption. And then they'll generalize it to everywhere in the world because they're stupid. So, well, actually, I don't think it's because they're stupid. I think it's because they don't care. So the UN figure is based on multiplying global quantity consumed by something approximating US levels for prices. The range for U.S. heroin retail prices is cited at seventy to nine hundred dollars per street gram. I mean, look at that variance: seventy dollars to nine hundred dollars. So this would produce this produces a global sales of between fifty billion and six hundred and forty-one billion. Okay, the UN and an analysis analysts, after reporting the midpoint of this huge range of three hundred and forty-six billion, then choose a lower price of one hundred and fifty dollars a gram, reflecting data from Western Europe and Oceania, to produce an apparently conservative figure of one hundred and seven billion for heroin. Like this is just voodoo bullshit, right? So this is quite normal. So I went for like the most nuts and bolts shit that I could find. Like how many people went into the hospital? How many people got fucking thrown in jail? How many people did this, 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 right? And I go to first world countries who have the capacity to enforce these things. So, and then you describe all of the context and you say, blah, blah, blah. So in the particular case of Japan, there's very little critical engagement with the reliability of their data sources and only one peer reviewed paper regarding their utility for representing the state of drug abuse in the country. So only one person has actually written anything but how reliable the Japanese um, data sources are. And that guy is called David Brewster. Now, David Brewster, I have problems with. I don't want to be mean to him because he was actually helpful to me because I contacted him and asked him about where, where to get numbers from. And he helped point me up to a few places. So I don't want to be mean to him, but I think that he's wrong. 
about where he's coming from because he argued that uh, he argued that it's all about culture. So he goes, you know, the reason that Japan is doing so well with drugs is because of their culture, something, something, like in that sort of vague way, like Japanese culture does it. But then he wants to import, he's trying to convince Japanese policymakers because he's at one of the Japanese universities and he's trying to convince policymakers there to adopt Western policies for dealing with drugs, which just... And to look at, so he's essentially taking the culture over there and trying to change it. Why? Just leave it. It's working. I mean, okay, never mind. Um, so he criticizes the nationwide general population survey. That's the one way Japanese send out a whole bunch of mail in um so mail in surveys. Ask people how many, how much drugs do you take? What do you think about drugs? Blah blah blah. Um, so in reality, it may be impossible to know the actual extent of any of the phenomena we're measuring, but this is not unique to studying drug abuse. It applies to the whole of the social sciences, a notoriously woolly field of inquiry. Nevertheless, based on the opinions of senior professionals in the field, it appears that the more indicators used, the more multidimensional the picture, and thus the more reliable the general impression created. But as the adage goes, the facts do not speak for themselves. Even given factual statistics, we must interpret them. So then I talk about some biases in the literature. People pay attention to the United States, and the only regular stand-in for conservative policy in the West is Sweden. Everyone else has got a liberal policy. You just go like Sweden, and then what they usually do is they'll take the United States and they say, ah, the United States has a conservative policy because they've got like high penalties in some states. You know, but I mean, like the United States has like got no borders between the 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 the, the, the states that have um drug control in the states that do uh don't um and just the the warring factions in in u.s security policy and law enforcement it just it's ridiculous uh so funding for this research is also led by liberal organizations you know um you know and so you almost get nothing defending the conservative model at all, not since like the 90s. Um, and yeah, it's fucking mad. Uh, some interesting things here about, um, uh, about like general correlations, what you get in funny, in interesting places. All of this is very interesting, but you know, um, you know, healthcare, blah, blah, blah. But if I go on about that, I'll be here forever. And then I'll just go over the, um, so this, this, the theory basically here, I'm not going to cover this. I'm going to go to, so this is this, this section, I know this is going to sound really lame, but so this thing is historical institutionalism. Basically what I'm saying is, well, we're just going to look at everything and over a long period of time. And I've got to, prove that that's a good idea and it's got some rigorous theory behind it by citing all the people who analyzed history in that way uh situational action theory that was actually an interesting one for the first and it's like the most radically like common sense way of looking at things and everyone tries to like say oh well it's this one variable that causes it and he just like it's kind of fucking revolutionary Really, really great uh, criminologist from Sweden called Per Olof uh, Wikström. Um, uh, citizens are vastly... Uh, here we go. Uh, to explain what makes people conform to the law, one must explain what causes people to break it. This requires the use of a general theory of crime. If the definition of crime cannot be generalized beyond the breach of law, which according to the literature it cannot, it requires an explanation of what causes people to conform with or transgress behavioral codes in general and law in particular. Examinations of the moral dimensions of crime have been offered in economics, jurisprudence, and criminology, but is not particularly widely used. And the current social science paradigm tends to see people more as the blind tools of invisible forces, material incentives, and social structures than as moral agents. However, in 2004, uh, Cambridge criminologist Pad Olaf Wickstrom and neuroscientist Kyle, uh, uh, I, think, I think she actually, I don't know if it's Kyle Treiber or if it's Kyle Treiber, because um, I think she, because it's a woman and, I, uh, and uh, she's, 
I think she's also Swedish. Uh, developed a theory called a situational action theory to explain criminal behavior, which has been used in empirical studies on youth delinquency, drug use, and terrorist recruitment, amongst other crimes. It draws on empirical findings from neuroscience, combining observations across major fields of social sciences. It centers on morality and relies on a few basic premises, the foremost of which is that human beings are rule-guided agents, not constantly calculating self-interested subjects. While SAT was designed as an individual level theory, many of its core features are adaptable to the national societal scale. So, yeah, so that's something I'm doing um, that I... I didn't think I didn't bump, find anyone who was doing that. So anyway, it describes the interactions between microphenomena, sorry, individual choices and macrophenomena, which is law, state institutions, economic and social processes in a systematic model. Rather than seeking to explain away the variance of crimes through the use of demographic filters like race, age, sex or culture, Wikström instead relegates these to causes of causes which have a correlation with crime statistics, but cannot actually explain why crime is committed. So one cannot say that a person committed a crime because they were young, because they were black, poor, or Muslim, because plenty of those people don't do it, uh, don't do crime. Plenty of white people don't do supposed white people things, whatever. So what exactly is what the thing that causes the individual to commit the crime, they say, they commit crimes because of specific motives and the situational process that synthesizes personal morality, the setting, and the motivation. So it brings these, all, these, all these things together. Historical emergence of the normative setting and the morality of the person over their lifetime. So, uh, the, 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 so there's, a, there's a little bit about the, the history that went into creating the theory. And then this is um, crimes are the result of a choice between um, between uh, what he calls action alternatives. So if you if you see um, if you see different alternatives, then you'll sort of deliberate over them and make a conscious decision to act one way or the other. But and then that's driven by various motives, which fall under two categories: temptation and provocation. So temptations are fairly self-explanatory and provocations are frictions caused by the intrusion of some person or obstacle between the agent and their desired state of affairs. So provocation is like what causes people to be violent. Like you, you provoke people into murder, you provoke people to whatever. I mean, obviously it's not your fault, but the, the, uh, the way it's sort of perceived by the person making that decision is always that you provoke them, right? Choice to indulge in our desires without out of temptation or provocation is constrained by two factors, self-control and external deterrence. Our personal morals and the norms of the setting do not always coincide. When it comes into conflict with our personal morality or wanton habit, the law has the power to offer deterrence to our transgressions or incentives to our cooperation, as does the judgment of others whose judgment matters to us. The advantage that this has over other general theories of crime is that it reduces crime to the single common characteristic, which is rule-breaking. So what, you, what it really sort of says is that you're, um, so I threw, threw in this nice thing about like South Africa and, and violations of, 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 um, of, of apartheid laws. Like when you break a law, it's generally because you feel that you're morally entitled to do so. Um, you know, it was right to do this, or it was at least acceptable to do that, you know, um, and that's the nature of morality. Morality is, uh, is, is rules about what to do. So th th this is a very th th interesting thing. They say, well, why do people break crime, break the law? Because they disagree with that law. It's, it's mind-blowingly simple. It's mind-blowingly simple. And then it says, well, why would someone do anything in general? Well, because they're tempted to it or they're frustrated and they took out the... It's, 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 it's like he constructs this whole thing to say the most simple construct this whole fucking labyrinthine argument in order to justify the most obvious shit in the world which is people commit crimes because they don't believe that it's wrong to do so <laughs> so yeah so here's what i was doing okay uh so, so i've explained why i picked the two countries so i said in order to demonstrate that situational action theory can be used to explain the differences in drug policy outcomes uh, I've adapted variables at a macro, uh, macro scale, I exclude variables. Blah, 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 blah. 
Um, so I've excluded what's irrelevant, which is frustration or difficult, impossible to measure, which is self-control. So self-control, obviously they say that self-control is a big feature. If you aren't trained in how to control yourself, you're going to commit more spontaneous crimes. Um, yeah, big, big deal, but you can't measure it. So, um, yeah. So statistics are here in the public record operationalization. So for each country, brief background, one page on the, actually, you know, I'm going to fucking skip this because this is for, this is, this is nitpicky stuff. Um, and this isn't more nitpicky stuff. And so uh, this is all nitpicky stuff. It's, it's important only if you're in, if you really want to get academic on this, uh, the interesting, um, the interesting stuff would be institutional foundation. So basically I wrote like a little history of each country's drug policy and it's fucking nuts. Actually, this shit is fucking nuts. So the UK has a long, uh, public health centered approach to drugs. Um, and most of their policies are defined in the early 20th century. So there's, uh, the responding to native pressures in Egypt, British authorities placed a ban on narcotics with emphasis on refined white drugs, that's heroin, morphine, and cocaine, um, over raw brown drugs, which is opium and hashish. So that's the that's where we get the hard and soft drugs distinction we have today. So the Rolleston Report of 1926, composed of a group of Brit British medical professionals, proposed a ban on the possession of drugs without prescription, because that was back home in England, that's what they were responding to, and handed the power to prescribe white drugs to doctors. The report des designated addiction as a disease. So that's where we get the idea that addiction is a disease now, but there's plenty of reason to think it isn't. Um, and rather that it is a function of behavior because people generally do drugs because they like to do drugs. And um, yeah, addiction is a function of people's perceived, or what they perceive that they are entitled to get away with. Um, for the most part, um, yeah. And withdrawal symptoms for heroin are not actually that intense. Um, they really aren't. The problem is that they're so bloody nice that, and they make life, um, I mean, opiates really do, they don't just make physical pain go away, they make psychological pain go away. And life is full of psychological pain, which is why people like opiates, because it makes even the most horrific and humiliating circumstances bearable. Um, and so that's really what what makes people addicted to to opiates. The, the physical withdrawal symptoms are really not pleasant, but, you know, anyone can get over them. It's not, it's, you know, it, if you really want to. Um, but living life with with difficulties and living life without pain is a very difficult choice for people to make. So the provision of heroin to addicts was prevalent throughout the 20th century by doctors. But until the 1970s, unlicensed possession of heroin, cannabis, and cocaine were punished with imprisonment, with no difference of schedule under the 1928 Dangerous Drugs Act, drafted to assess uh, to address a failure of regulatory uh, of the regulatory attempt in 1922 to prevent doctors from prescribing drugs to themselves. Yeah, fucking degenerates. Doctors were the only source of hard drugs, and arrests for breach of policy remained not roughly 50 per year, except for the brief spike during the Second World War. Following the post-war emergence of drugs via the French Connection and the United States servicemen, buffered by a growing counterculture, caused the number of addicts to triple between 1955 and 1965. The government responded with a more closely controlled clinic system where patients could be monitored. Doctors prescribed a wider variety of maintenance drugs, including heroin, but switched to methadone in 1970. The number of... Uh, so methadone is a, a kind of opiate, but it's you get less of a, a euphoria from it and it lasts longer. Yeah, but yeah, the, the number of addicts registered, the quality of drugs seized and the arrests made all doubled in the following decade, leading to increased concern that the clinic system was failing. In this period, the number of arrests for cannabis possession increased from 185 in 1959 to 2,393 in 1967. 
This precipitated a committee investigation into drug, drug use published in 1969, which advised, advised not to prosecute first-time offenders for possessions of small amounts of cannabis and recommended that sale or supply should not be punished with anything more, than, more severe than a hundred pound fine. Now, here's the thing. The late 1960s, every single nation on the planet conducted, uh, sorry, not every nation on the planet, but every nation within the first world, within the Western scope, uh, did these kind of investigation uh, committees into whether or not to ban drugs. And all of them went for a slightly softer approach uh, to what they'd done by knee-jerk in the 1960s. South Africa was one of the earliest. Um, South Africa and the United States were among the earliest to respond to this with pro with strong prohibition, and everyone kind of followed suit through the 60s. But then at the late 60s, most of Western Europe decided they were going to turn around and do um, and investigate why not to do it. Sweden decided to go for hard, strict, serious total prohibition, and everyone else said liberalize. It's kind of like now with the lockdown thing, Sweden doing the opposite to the rest of the Western world. Um. So the liberal leaning committee concluded uh, that the philosophy around su the su around substance abuse needed to change. At the time, the trial of Mick Jagger for cannabis possession was a prominent cause of liberal political concern. A legalization ad uh, advocacy group called SOMA, Jesus, if you've read Huxley's Brave New World, this is like, what? It posted a front page advertisement funded by NITA to Beatles member Paul McCartney in the Times newspaper calling for the commission to debate the scheduling of cannabis separately to take off the focus of LSD, which was successful. So they, they debated the two drugs separately instead of talking about how do we deal with psychedelics, right? And then there's a guy in the, the – there was one guy who is a very strong liberal advocate in the Wooten, uh, Wooten Commission who managed to convince all of these guys who knew nothing about drugs at all that actually it was totally harmless and it was just like um, – it wasn't, and it was totally fine, and so we don't worry about it. And so they came out and said, ah, just a little fine. That's all you need. So following the suggestions of the report, the 1971 Misuse of Drugs Act made a distinction between possession and wholesale trade. And while it allowed for a sentence of up to six months, the Lord Hailsham instructed the Magistrates Association, when the law received loyal assent, royal assent in 1973, to enforce the legislation only in the case of large-scale trafficking. The powers to imprison were curtailed further in 1976, placing a maximum sentence of three months for, uh, for any offense regarding cannabis. And a subsequent advisory council reported that prison sentences for cannabis possession were all but abolished. Crucial to understanding the British system, aside from the attitudes of the ruling class, is the unique system of common law the United Kingdom operates on. Judges have a great deal of leeway in interpreting the law and follow prosecution guidelines established by non-legislative policies, which can vary substantially, by which I mean that the parliament doesn't actually control the sentencing uh, guidelines. They're written up by bureaucrats, which can vary substantially in sentencing recommendations. By the 1990s, prison sentences for uh, offenses involving cannabis were uncommon, and the law with regard to this drug was all but unenforced. This reflected a consensus amongst policymakers that progress meant liberal reform, communicating to the public that drug prohibition was old-fashioned, and keeping with the times meant increasingly lenient or accepting attitudes to drug consumption. Consequently, the current strategy in England and Wales emphasizes trafficking over consumption. The 94 Drug Trafficking Act imposes extra penalties for trafficking in drugs designated under the schedules of the 1971 Misuse of Drugs Act, including 25 years to life for trafficking in Class A drugs, which is heroin and cocaine, and a change in sentencing in 2000 introduced a minimum seven-year sentence for a third repeated conviction for any trafficking offence. Possession of substances under the drug schedules A, B, and C incur maximum sentences of five, seven, five, and two years, respectively, with cannabis and amphetamine-type substances classified as Class B, and a long list of... So, tick and cannabis are the same schedule in, in, in the UK. It's very weird. A long list of, a list of less harmful drugs, including steroids, under Class C. The 71 law itself has seen little change since, except for a brief change in the scheduling of cannabis. Ah, uh, there's a bit of a story behind that. It's like a big flip-flop that happened. Um, yeah. Uh, so Japan has maintained a strict normative consensus on drugs since the end of the Second World War, when the extraordinary um, epidemic of amphetamine abuse emerged and was swiftly crushed 
with an uh, effective, uh, effectiveness perhaps only matched by Sweden from 1970 to 1990. At a time when the rest of the world is leaning towards decriminalization, Japan remains conservative. This comes from a collective and institutional memory of dealing with the post-war drugs crisis and a historical memory of the open wars in China and efforts to eradicate opium in the colonies. So that's the introduction, but here's the, here's the, here's the big kicker. So seeing the effect of the opium wars in China and seeing to expand and strengthen the nation, the Meiji Empire strictly forbade the import of narcotics. They created a state monopoly on opium, which sold exclusively to its colonies, Korea, Japan, uh, Korea, and Taiwan, and so on, rationing and reducing the supply through individual licenses for addicts to remarkable success. So let me just see if I wrote this in the, yeah, I did here. From 6.3% of the population of Taiwan, the number of registered smokers declined to 0.5% of the population in 1930. So that's that's pretty massive. So in a few years, they almost eradicated opium abuse in, their ter in these territories. They set up the world's first scientific medical research center for the treatment and study of drug addiction in 1924, which engendered a benevolent, so-called benevolent approach to addicts, which used overbearing supervision combined with weaning maintenance and substitution measures. The model evolved into a combination of cold turkey detox and vocational labor training that became the norm for the next century. However, the normative consensus against drug abuse was not completely widespread throughout society. Japan had invented methamphetamine in the late 19th century, so now you know where tech comes from, and used it as a means of augmenting the performance of its soldiers in combat throughout the Second World War. Immediately following the occupation, the legality and availability of amphetamines led to an uncontrolled proliferation of private companies selling the product openly, and a national census produced a figure of 7.5% of the population with experience of amphetamine abuse, three quarters of which being daily users. After a schoolgirl was found dead and raped in a school bathroom, the victim of a hiropon, which is the the, the name of the, the of, of methamphetamine in, in Japanese, a victim of a hiropon addict, the incident became the catalyst of a nationwide civil society effort. It was the culmination of years of national distress at a skyrocketing problem of addiction, delinquency, and death. And this narrative still deeply embedded in the social memory. So then, like, look at this. Persons arrested for drug-related crimes. I mean, I mean, look at that. That's incredible. So they talk about that as being the first wave, and then this is the second wave. It was driven by uh, the Yakuza. They, they had a crackdown on, I can't remember if it was on gambling or something like that around this period of time. And so the, the 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 gangsters got into the drug trade. Although I think it's really remarkable that it's around 1969. So there's a lot about the effect of the American soldiers and the CIA getting into the drugs trade in uh, in Southeast Asia. Um, a lot of a lot of people who are like situationally adjacent to that were involved in opium trafficking in China well into the 20th century, many of them who ended up as presidents in the United States and so on. Uh, anyway, the post-war legislation for controlling the methamphetamine epidemic and expanding mental health system was drafted by Dr. Kaneko Chunji, who, was, who also introduced Western psychiatry. Uh, Chunji saw drug abuse and other deviant lifestyles to be precursors of anti-community behavior such as support for revolutionary ideologies and other disruptive forces. So all degeneracies together. The rapid and effective manner it was dealt with has shaped subsequent drug policy and cultural values. The government continues to frame its drug policy problem in epidemiological terms, describing three waves, uh, focusing on meth, the most popular hard drug in Japan. The second meth wave in the 60s and 70s was fueled by organized crime, uh, here we go. So you've got a whole bunch of laws they call special laws, um, um, and then they've got. A, and then I've got it talked about how they centralise the service. Um, they have a very centralised service. The, the drug prohibition laws will actually run from the cabinet, so they've actually got a guy in the cabinet who's in charge of getting rid of drugs. Like the priority that they place on this is extraordinary. For the, for the British, drug law is just like some secondary feature of their. Uh, law enforcement policy. 
Um, and then, you know, the Japanese are very conscious of how foreign, uh, you know, sort of immigrant communities can be vectors for drug trafficking, which is true everywhere. Um, uh, and here we go. Here's the extent of the drug use. So this is just going to be numbers. And then, and then I'm going to get to like the nice fat tables that are just going to, oh, they're really, really good. So statistical indicators, whether from a law enforcement or public health institutions, demonstrate a stark, con stark contrast between Japan and England and Wales. So for Japan, only a single nationwide uh, hospital survey exists, which distinguishes between drug overdoses and other forms of poisoning, which reports a rate of 0 0.35 per 100,000 in 2014. So that's even including people who die from poisoning of any kind. So all poisonings and overdoses, all of them. 0 0.35 people per 100,000 people die that way in the whole of Japan. Um, uh, the, the, so, oh, no, no, sorry, that's the wrong one. So that's, 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 that's the overdoses for, for 2014 or 0 0.35. Vital statistics, which is that's uh, just like deaths in general, it's 0 0.55 for all poisoning. But then the English Welsh figure for the for just drug overdose mortalities, um, 6.6 .6 per hundred thousand. I mean, it's just the the it's more than 12 times. It's more than 12 times the size. It's enormous. Official hospital reports for Japanese addiction admissions are not available further back than the last fiscal year. But these can be found at the health services comparison site, Kalu, yep, uh, which has a registry of all hospital admissions in Japan. So, yeah, that's where I had to go for that. They place the number of drug-related admissions, that's psychoses, overdoses, or, um, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, that's uh, 23,000, 18.7 uh, per 100,000 population. Psychiatric admissions related to substance abuse is just under 8,000, which is 6 per 100,000 of the population. Latest figures for England and Wales, the mental hospital, um, mental hospital admissions for the drugs is the same absolute number, you know, 7,000 something. But because the UK is much smaller, that's double the per capita rate. And for overdose admissions, it's 30 per 100,000, which is, which is like it's, it's more than 50% more than, um, than uh, Japan. So data on mental hospital admissions produced, proved difficult to obtain. Like I couldn't, I couldn't translate the bloody documents. So I just, I just shrugged it off. Uh, Long-term public data paint just a stock picture. England and Wales statistics for HIV infections attributed to injection drug abuse. Completely dwarf the Japanese figure, despite the fact that Japan's most abuse of illicit drug methamphetamine is typically consumed by injection. So, like the most popular uh, drug to to use, illegal drug to use in Japan is tuck, but they don't smoke it; they inject it, right? So, the most popular illegal drug is an injection drug, and the transmission of inject in, injected diseases is negligible. You know. Um, uh, here we go. Police and courage. Uh, the Japanese survey on drug use derives about half of the volume of its positive lifetime responses from solvent abuse. So that's one thing that sort of jumped out is people who huff gasoline or glue or what have you. Those people uh, are on the drug, uh, like are part of the drug statistics in Japan. And it's, it's, it's annoying because there's some kind of, they, they conglomerate some of these things and it makes it, it makes it difficult to tease it out. The, the British actually just stopped counting that number in 2010. Uh, people who are huffing paint and, and glue and shit. That's just not even looked at, but in, in Japan, uh, it's the biggest, it's the biggest, it's one of the biggest categories here. Um, but it just, it's not illegal, so, yeah. A uh, number of warnings. Another feature is the specialized cannabis or cut warning, an informal but officially recorded warning issued by officers for possession of drug. Um, that's in the UK. The number of warnings issued began at 40,000 in the first year of use, peaked at 100,000 in 2009 before police were encouraged to further relax enforcement. So get this, instead of arresting people for drugs and then charging them with a fine, 
they were not told to just give them a warning. And then when the numbers kept climbing, uh, they eventually looked at the police and said, hey, guys, just stop doing anything, please, because the numbers are embarrassing. Um, I mean, for fuck's sake. So here's here's some lacquer lacquer things. So the the red is Britain because you know red coats, and the blue is Japan because, well, you know Japanese blue, nice. Anyway, so this is the, the solid line is so this is from the survey responses. Like, have you used any of these Ill illegal drugs in your lifetime? And the blue is Japan. I mean, look look at the distance. That's enormous. Anyway, but of course we have to say again, look. You're doing a survey, you ask people, they're not going to tell you the truth 100% of the time. And the Japanese are very ashamed of taking drugs. So obviously it'll be lower. So we go, okay, that's just an indicator. Um, we don't have to take that one too seriously. So then you go, okay, total drug arrest per capita thousand. And you go, well, you know, Japan's really strict. They'll be arresting tons of people, right? No. No, they're not. They're not arresting tons of people. They're they're barely arresting anyone in comparison. I mean, look at the, look at that for England and Wales. There we go. And this is from 1990, uh, 1990 to twenty nineteen. So I've, that's what, and this is ninety five to 20, 2019. Like new cases of HIV attributed to drug abuse. I mean, it's like Japan is fucking flatlined, and and England and Wales is like this. I mean, it's declining because uh, antiretrovirals are increasing and. Um, yeah, and, and there's a number of other factors like uh, people use heroin less in, in the UK than they, they used to. Um, the big heroin generation, you know, peaked early, peaked in the 90s. So here's my favorite graph because this is how much this is how much of all of the drugs the um, the people are actually. Uh, are catching at the ports, the, how much the customs agents and police are seizing. So um, the red dots, all the lines with red dots are for the UK, all the lines with blue dots are for the for, for the Japanese. And then each line is a different drug. So like light blue is cocaine and yellow is amphetamines and related things. So I grouped amphetamines and MDMA uh, together. So that number's been added together for this because I just call anything that's like an amphetamine because they're a family of chemicals that can be categorized in a certain way. Um, and then brown for heroin, you know, golden brown, texture like sun. Um, and then green for cannabis, which is fairly straightforward. So the thing is, th all of these all of these things dwarf the Japanese. They just like trundle along the bottom, right? But the cannabis, the, the cannabis number was so huge. The seizures were so big that it actually, I had to plot it on a different axis. So like all of the, um, all of the numbers in um, kilograms. So I normalized the number of uh, the amount of drugs that are consumed. So I said, these are the, this is the kilogram quantity of drugs that have been caught divided by, um, by millions of citizens, right? So uh, how many millions of citizens they have? So, so that it's the same per capita amount, and you get a number. So here we go on the one side. I had to, I had to divide that number by five to to actually plot it on the same number because it would be sitting way up here, and then all of these, the all of these lines get compressed down to the bottom, and Japan is basically invisible. It's, it's just, it's lewd. The difference is ludicrous. So then you look at like deterrence factors, right? So that those are indicators for how much people are consuming. Right, you know your your hospital admissions, your your disease vectors, your you know how much they're catching at the ports, you know that that kind of thing, right? So the deterrence over here is that you have, uh, I mean, look at this shit. This is how they're sentencing people. The flexibility of sentencing in England and Wales is very wide in keeping with the common law tradition, which aims to take individual uh, circumstances, community interests, and common morality into consideration in case law. Judges have a discretion to apply anything from a small fine up to 14 years in prison for the trafficking of drugs beneath the most severe category. I have a recommended sentencing for class A drugs is 16 years and allows sentences sentence up to life imprisonment. Still, custodians, uh, custodial sentences, that means chucking people in jail, are not typically as common as they are in Japan. The British proceed to prosecution far less frequently. So this is 
drug-related prosecutions by sentence time. So this is what, you know, um, this is the sentencing rate. That is, once you're arrested, what happens to you? This is a question of how strictly these things are enforced. So the solid line is you're given, you're put into immediate custody. That means you're sent to prison. The dotted line um, is a non-custodial sentence, which is um, set free, given a warning, uh, whatever. And then there's the suspended custody, which is anything where they, they, they've they've given you a sentence and they said you can serve it later or um, or we'll suspend it um, pending um, uh, good behavior, and if you're if you're a good, competent citizen, then we you know we won't impose the sentence on you. So that red line for how often an immediate custody is uh, immediate sentencing is imposed, that's that's about fifty percent uh, more often than than England does. And then for you know a suspended custody, it's way higher. But you, what England and Wales does is they almost universally impose something that's like a little fine or whatever. And so there's that that really high flying uh, dotted line over there. And fuck, I mean, like nearly eighty percent of I mean over here it's eighty percent um, and down to goes down to like seventy uh, odd percent um, in recent years. I mean, this is nuts, right? So in 2002, the Westminster government um, attempted to lower the scheduling of cannabis to Class C, but reversed this decision under public pressure. Sentencing guidelines did not consider Class C an arrestable offense. Um, so you got a lot of re uh, weakening of blah, blah, blah. Then I talk about new labor, but this one's a really fucking big doozy here as well, because this is how many arrests result in prosecution of any kind. And... So the previous one is what happens once you're sentenced, like once you're once you're prosecuted, and then, and this is how many of the arrests actually result in it. And again, England and Wales much lower than Japan, so less strictly enforced. Um, and then there's other little things I talk about here about like how Japan does like community policing and they get get involved and. Um, and then some discussion about you know the culture within there, but it's 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 neither here nor there. I mean, there's a lot of these these are details at the moment. So how available are drugs? So you have to. Um, so the way I talk about this is I say that they've made there, there are a lot of ways in which the the like treatment facilities make it easier for people to get hold of drugs. They'll they'll go in and they'll get like substitute drugs like methadone and they'll trade it in for heroin on the on the black market. Um, they'll sell it on for for, for you know. Um, so then, yeah, there's there's zero enforcement music festivals and well not zero but basically zero. Um, there's a tolerant attitude to drug use everywhere in society in the UK. Pretty much no one judges you if you if, if you consume drugs, unless you're like in the upper middle class, you know. It's, or if you're Muslim, you know, Muslims will uh, judge you for using drugs, but then they're in a permissive society and they tend to break the rules themselves as well. Um, so, yeah, More, less so than everyone else, but to some extent. Uh, Japan, having placed a high pressure on the industry, has driven up the typical price of almost all drugs. Here we go. And to multiple times the value of the English-Welsh equivalent. So what we're seeing here, the only one that's really comparable in terms of price is cannabis. So cannabis is you know, it's right down there, but you, you can barely see that. That's you know that's 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 a fair amount more many a few times more expensive than it is in the uk but it's yeah i mean you can look at that pretty much everything is more expensive um, and these these are all sort of price estimates based on like the based on how much um based on surveys investigations done by the police you know either country um, that they reported to the uh, UN under uh, under um, uh, methodology guidelines that are common to both countries. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, then you get some of the interesting stuff. So, like, these are the survey responses. So, 
the the problem with the English ones is that some of them are behind are are not accessible. I'd have to like specially request them, and then that can take months. So I only took the ones that are publicly available, and I took a little sample of these. Um, took a little sample of them, and I would have very much liked to compare them, but it's hard. So the the positive response is to how easy is it to obtain. Uh, drugs so they'll say like easy hard and it's like four different levels i'll just cut them into um and then i i didn't separate these because the 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 the, the categories were different on the english questionnaire so I, I just left them as they are more or less um so the, the reason i had to break it down like this is that in japan they have solvents over here and they don't they don't allow you to calculate the any drug because there's no the data set doesn't actually include the raw data couldn't get hold of that so i can't separate out solvent abuse which is extremely frustrating so if you look at any drug i had i had to include this so that you can see that the any drug answer is mostly made up of the people who had you know huffed paint back in high school how easy so this is how easy is it to obtain drugs and that is like the people responding that it's easy to get hold of solvents are like well i can go down to the hardware store and get something you know um that i can get high on uh then in wales you know but of course they they, they prove it so here the numbers are very much different so uh, everything below here I'm assuming that there's a fair amount of overlap um, between these these numbers, but yeah, there's no, there's no, there's no. I mean, very easy, fairly easy. These numbers are always consistently high. Um, yeah, I mean, they're much higher than for any of these drug categories down here. Um, so then I did one on law relevant morality. That's like, do they agree that it's wrong to take drugs or that, you know, it should be illegal? So the problem with that is that it's been spotty. So I, I tried to get a comprehensive thing that covers like 1989 till the present, um, like at least till 2017. So Ipsos Mori conducted a repeated survey in 1989 and 2019. And they showed a decline in the belief that it's wrong to take drugs. It's interesting because on that survey, they also asked people about like abortion and same-sex marriage and all that kind of stuff. So there's massive changes in the last 30 years, largely driven, in my opinion, by changes in media, communication, and education policy. That's besides the point. Um, decline in the belief that it's wrong to take drugs from 60% to 29 for cannabis. And from 89 to 76, uh, 67 for hard drugs. So from, you know, it's really, really wild. So this is just like a little collection of uh, surveys. Um, they asked another one in 2013, another one in 2000. One on, this one's on cannabis, and that one's just any drug. Should it be illegal? Um, and so 60% said yes. Um, and so... Should all drugs be legal? Only 60% said all drugs should be legal in 2013. But by 2019, it's like the number of people who think that um, it's wrong to take cannabis is down to 29%. And the number of people who say that it's wrong to do heroin is down to two thirds of the population. So there's another one. 32% uh, of respondents are in favor of legalizing drugs. 40% uh, are in favor of providing a taxation and 21-year-old age limit. Uh, so ICM research found that 38% supported decriminalizing possession. Um, and then this is an interesting one. They say, I regard most drug addicts of criminal as criminals. Only 38% says so. 94%, however, agree that it's a minister society, which is an interesting one, which, you know, you can interpret as meaning that people think, well, you know, drugs are not a great idea, but, like, you shouldn't stop people from doing them, you know, like, that would be bad, which is just... Anyway. A uh, conservative drug policy reform group showed that only 40% of conspirators, and when I say conservative, I don't mean conservatives in actually conservative. I mean, they're attached to the conservative party and they actually think that drugs should be legalized because the conservative party in the UK is left-wing 
and then the Labour Party is even more left wing, and the Liberal Democrats Party is for whatever the globalist agenda is in the moment, and so they just go along with everything. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of that. Crime survey for England and Wales, you know, is it okay to use these drugs? Um, and that's in 2015 or 16. They say it's never okay to take cannabis. Only 64% say that. 90% say cannabis, uh, say that for cocaine and 90% for ecstasy. For getting drunk, it's 21%. <laughs> it shows you like, it shows you what that's made of. Anyway. So these, uh, over, I mean, this is all we've got for this period of time, but that's much more different. Anyway, in a general trend, you see towards liberalization from, and a persistent cohort of roughly a fifth to two fifths of the population do not believe the law should prohibit the consumption of at least cannabis. Uh, and then I described how aggressive the Japanese um, model is of tackling um, in the public. They'll, they'll like shame celebrities for if they're caught using drugs they tell the students no never don't even touch it under any circumstances totally evil you know it's very, very hard and they do they teach the students no drugs not like the english who are a bit like laissez-faire about it so, I mean, uh they've they they, they 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 try to help people understand how drugs are used and why they're used and so it makes people way too familiar with drug culture um in my opinion um i think making it alien and frightening is very good and it works um but of course if they don't if they think that they're teacher but then there's a discussion earlier i make about like about education and studies that have been done in to show that um you know, if you, if the students don't think that you're being honest with them, then they don't trust you and then they might try drugs anyway. And so there's a lot of, you have to be honest with them about what the risks and what the nature of drug abuse are, but you also don't want to make them too familiar with it, to, you know, making it sort of seem like something that's normal. Um, so, yeah. And then the Japanese are fantastic because they say, they the, I love the survey, like the word, wording of the questions is beautiful is it wrong whether it's legal or not you know like 90 percent like 80 to 90 percent um but it is trending towards liberalization as they become more globalized so then they ask for cannabis and meth and meth so from 90 percent in 1997 it's gone down to 76 percent in 2017 um and then you've got meth goes on from 90, barely changes. Like everyone thinks that shit is chaf. Okay. Um, and of course, then there's a number here down that's the people who didn't answer the survey at all. So, uh, stuff about the cons uh, school. And then I conclude and say a whole bunch of stuff. But here's the analysis here. And I'm just going to wind down with this. Wickstrom's theory provides a tonic to the conceptual confusion that surrounds crime. It's the only theory I came across that described crime for what it is, regardless of context, breaking the law. Therefore, it's the only general theory of crime which allows one to treat any breach of law as a dependent variable in itself. The main concepts of the causes of crime also translate well from individual decision-making to environmental and institutional states of affairs. A strong popular disapprobation of drug use makes radical liberal reforms difficult to enact openly. Um, and keeps most people from indulging in transgression. Strict enforcement deters social transgression by those who are not deterred by social judgment. But it also keeps transgressors from acquiring institutional power by marginalizing their views. Strict enforcement also reduces availability, which makes it easier for people to miss engaging in drug use when they are young and impulsive. Ultimately, however, the institutions and their evolution are what carries the bulk of the analysis beyond mere observation of difference. Once the balance of the ruling class in the United Kingdom had adopted a liberal attitude to drugs, members of the legislature, civil service, um, senior civil service, and judiciary moved to depenalize and partially decriminalize possession. By removing the strength of sanctions against drugs in England and Wales, 
The growing drugs community was never stamped out as it was in post-war Japan and allowed a growing normalization of the use of cannabis and other drugs, a pattern maintained by defeatism, tolerance, and, and victimhood narratives, increasing sympathy towards users of other drugs. With the collapse of community life in the West centered around church and the, center, the centralization of policing, detached as it became from community interface, the will and capacity of the authorities to control the normative drift of society waned, and moral a vacuum, which could have easily been filled by the education system, did little to help. Japan underwent precisely the opposite transformation, from handling out methamphetamine to soldiers and bureaucrats during the war, and allowing it to be sold over the counter at shops as pick-me-ups, led to a widespread common use, the government ferociously stamped down on the use of the drug, combining fierce and uncompromising enforcement of the law with vociferous propaganda and public denunciation. By applying similar sternness to their coloni colonies earlier, Japan transformed Taiwan and Korea from notoriously opium-addicted societies into sober societies where the drug is all but unheard of. In the modern era, rather than give in to social change, the Japanese cracked down repeatedly on every metamorphosis of the drug market to choke off supply. Public figures who flouted the rules were and are publicly denounced. By providing strong moral leadership and insisting on firm and consistent application of the law, lenient to the youth, and always with the option of treatment and rehabilitation, the Japanese government has been able to provide both the consistent moral example and maintain firm control over the opportunity to commit drug crimes. Overall, lessons learned from the evidence I have found indicate the importance of political leadership to the overall direction of the country and the strength of the government to shape the society it governs. Drug use is not a default position or human nature any more than it is the nature of people to act on any other selfish impulse. Moral attitudes can have a great effect on the behavior of society, and they can be strongly mediated by one's social environment. People require support to conform. Maintaining sobriety is harder in a pub than, a, than in a mosque, but if the imam allows drinks during prayer, things will not remain halal for long. So, um, yeah. So I talked about this a little bit. Uh, um, yeah, let me just have a look and see if there's anyone still watching thing. Oh, yeah, there is. About 20 of you. That's nice. Okay, so now I'm going to... Oh, take a breather. Let's uh, take the screen off. So you guys have been watching me for an hour and a half, gibbering on about an extremely boring and dry topic, but one which I think is very important. So, Swerum G. Interesting name, that. Um, is this the real Prohibition hasn't been tried yet stream? Yes, it is. Actually, no, it isn't, because real Prohibition has been tried in three or four places. And that is Japan, Korea, Taiwan, Singapore. I mean, there are other places, like Malaysia is okay. Malaysia is okay. Um, Taiwan is not terrible, um, but they, they've got nothing on the Northeast Asian countries. Absolutely nothing on them. China, I've no idea what they're doing. I'm not even going to try. Um, strongly disagrees, says Swaram G. Agrees, says Alice V. I don't know. Um, I don't know any baby barren with weed related problems. With alcohol, there are a few. Well, there are not a lot of people who are dumb enough to smoke weed while they're pregnant, are there? Um, although, yeah, uh, the thing is that it causes, uh, it, it doesn't cause like very, from, from what I gather, it doesn't cause like facial deformities. It causes mental deformities. So it'll cause, it'll cause problems with brain development. Um, I like how Portugal is marriage with heroin. Ha ha! No, you don't, because you don't know what they're doing. Uh, they look like they've brought heroin under control, but their heroin consumption is pretty high. The most of the Western world doesn't really enforce their drug laws all that much. They don't really give a shit. Um, uh, they allow many avenues to getting hold of uh, heroin, and uh, Portugal. Portugal, as I said really early on, Portugal uh, actually didn't enforce any of their drug laws between, well, more or less didn't enforce them. There were still a few judges and policemen who tried. 
but they more or less suspended enforcement of drug laws uh, from 1975 um, when the socialists took over. And so, yeah, it was, it's a shit show. And then in 2000, by the 90s, more than 1% of the population were heroin addicts. So it was a real, real issue. And um, so in 2001, they decided to scrap the laws on personal possession. And so everyone thought, aha, well, they've gone the legalizing route. Well, what they did is they actually introduced uh, regulations. They introduced uh, management. So basically, if you're caught with any drug, you're forced to go, forced by the police, by the force of law to go into rehab programs. Or else they start charging you fines. And then if you don't pay the fines, you get uh, contempt of court. And then you can go to prison for contempt of court. So uh, they kind of, they're, they're not as strict as they should be, but they've introduced, they actually became stricter after 2001 than they were before 2001. And so this is why I made a big deal about um, the difference between the laws on the books and the laws on the street. So that's a big deal as well. Um, another time I'll, I'll cover like some stuff about like Korea and, and uh, the Netherlands, because those are two interesting countries I'll actually do. Um, cause I got a little bit, I wrote about that on my blog cause they're really, really interesting. The Netherlands is fucking weird, uh, for their drug policy. Um, burr, burr, burr. have you ever seen a commie drink a glass of water? Hmm. Good question. Uh, yeah, they, they tend to like, I, I, I think that there's a, there's a lot of thing of, um, in lefty circles, people are very big on the whole, um, on the whole thing of like, oh, look at me. I'm a raucous, rakish, uh, you know, sort of fun loving, you know, pleasure having person. And so there's always that. I think, I think everyone tries to conform to this sort of ideal of, you know, rock and roll or disheveled sort of um, reprobate as, as a kind of uh, sort of romantic archetype. Um and so drug consumption and, and so on. Living clean living is not free left wing. Clean living is for fascists, apparently. Which I think is absolutely retarded. Um, clean living is good. Uh, doesn't matter where you're from. Uh Dachbreaker saying tax free moonshine off license. Uh I said a uh yeah, yeah, I say that a lot. Um Chot Allah is another one that I picked up when I was in Cape Town. <laughs> um, uh, water, water is a source of life. Um, Swaram G rolling up a fatty. Well, you know, it's, it's up to you, but you shouldn't do that. That's not, it's very stupid. Um, uh, fresh pure water to replenish our precious bodily fluids. Ah, uh, okay. I'm st uh, okay. It's uh, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, shit. I don't know if anyone's seen. Um, what is that film called? Um, uh, uh, come on, uh, Dr. Strangelove, Dr. Strangelove. Uh, try the, the commies trying to get your precious bodily fluids. Um, there you go. Floridization. <laughs> uh. <laughs> General DJ. Yeah, there we go. That's some good training. Um, Timobor saying, how much do you think genetics contributes to the crime rates of different groups? I have not looked at that with any seriousness. Maybe that is a project for another time when I'm feeling a bit more rebellious. But for right now, I'm chilling. I'm in my chill zone, and I'm not ready to tackle that. Um, uh, drugs can be managed, unfortunately. Once it's been introduced, getting it out is always a problem. There you go. Now that's that's the thing. It's it, you know it, it really is. But as I pointed out with the Japanese, if you're if you're enough of a bastard about it and you're very strict and very serious, you can get rid of it pretty much from society. I mean, people don't you know Taiwan, uh, South you know Taiwan and Korea were rid of opium by the Japanese. 
Beparked. Um, let's see who else has got a good question, a comment, or something. Okay, they're about uh, people are so against abortion, but it's okay to let that same baby grow in an intoxicated mother. No, it isn't. The mother should not be drinking and fuck anyone who thinks otherwise. Um, and taking a child from a mother is punishment for the child too. So, yeah, I mean, it kind of is, but it depends who who's, who raises the child afterwards. Um, Rob knows his amphetamines. I have, interestingly enough, I've got a nice book over there, the purple one on the corner on the end. I don't know if you can see it. My finger is just underneath it. little purple book over there. It's on the chemistry of mind-altering drugs, and it's when it was published, it was the only book of its kind. It's a fairly comprehensive thing. It covers all of these different families of chemicals, what they do to the body, what they do to the brain, um, you know, a little bit of history behind their discovery um, and synthesis and so on. So it's very good to get on. Just Google the Chemistry of Mind-Altering Drugs book and you'll find it. And pro There's probably a more recent edition than that uh, on the market, you know. Uh, yep, yeah, don't drink when you're driving. You can drink as you like. I don't think you should be dr getting drunk at all. You know, and uh, the good book does prohibit it, does prohibit drunkenness, um, as do most religions. Hey, Rob, have you heard of Ben Shapiro's view on drugs? And if so, what do you think about that? No, I don't know what his opinion is on drugs. It's probably stupid because he... Um, he believes in whatever is politically convenient and well within the Overton window, and so he'd never be um, he'd never be as wild and and hairy as someone like myself who advocates for total prohibition and the moral disapprobation of anyone who engages in self intoxication. Although I have to admit, I have let myself go on alcohol before, and um, yeah. I, I haven't been perfect with it. I mean, although for, for a very long time, I haven't. Um, I've been pretty good with that. It's very difficult because if, you, if you've if you been at a university like I have and you've been sort of a very heavy party-going person, there's that tipping point where you're at a party, you've had like a drink or two, and then like there's just that little threshold that you cross where all of a sudden you stop, you lose your inhibitions just enough that you th that it becomes a downward spiral. And that was for me a big deal. So binge drinking was way too easy. You cross like a couple of units and then it's like, fuck it. I'm going to, you know, you keep going until you're completely smashed. And that was, that was kind of how I was. Um, and so anytime I was out, I was usually blind drunk um, most of the time. But I mean, there's a lot of students who are like that. Are alcohol holic beverages more toxic than THC? Yes. Yes, they are. Um, strong cultural and social boundaries are more persuasive in deterring transgression and abuse than legislative prohibition. No, uh, these things go hand in hand. They're exactly the same mechanism. You have to see the law and society as one. The state, while it is a separate organism in society, it's separate individual, a separate group of individuals who are doing those jobs. It's part of the society as a whole, right? So, like the moral. The, the laws are moral rules. There are a special category of moral rules that are enforced with the threat of violence. And so when you say moral disapprobation is enough, no, it clearly isn't. And the thing is, the more people violate um, moral approbations, uh, moral judgment, moral rules, um, the more normalized it becomes. Those people participate in um, dialogue with society to legitimize their behavior. And so the more you let something be normalized, the more it will be normalized. And a good way to combat normalization is through the is through strict enforcement. And you have to have a strong will in society to enforce that. And that is how it works. You you loosen the laws, you loosen the laws, you strengthen the laws, you strengthen the laws. These things are very like social pressures are they're very few paradoxical social pressures. Most social pressures are fairly linear. Um, 
fines have the application of fines has has some paradoxical effect but not if you make the fine proportional to the person's wealth if you do that then it's linear again um so Variata is saying uh, strong cultural and social boundaries are more persuasive in deterring trans. Oh, yeah, I've just read that one. Uh, regardless of the US efforts, why are they still losing on the war of drugs? Because they're fucking retarded. I mean, like you, you, some parts of the United States, they'll have three strike laws and then you'll be caught for something stupid and you'll get sentenced to life in prison. And ev this reduces the legitimacy of these laws incredibly because everyone can see that that's tyrannical. And the laws being legitimate and agreed to by everyone is kind of the point of the whole theory that I had behind my paper is that it's law relevant morality, right? So if people disagree with this, then they're not going to, um, then they're not going to assent to it. The other thing is that um, a lot of places don't enforce the drug laws. In California, it's been really wild. I mean, back to the 60s, they had a whole bunch of experimental public programs and there's a woman who drew up a project where she actually encouraged and with government permission in Los Angeles it was no it was San Francisco sorry I can't remember her name now but she drew up a, a, a camp a thing where she encouraged young people like even teenagers to come and experiment with drugs to learn about it as an alternative lifestyle like just the level of depravity that goes on in America in some places is just unbelievable. And so you have this combination of like ridiculously strict laws and ridiculously lenient laws across a country that has, uh, that shares a sort of common consciousness about society that makes this sort of a schizophrenic environment. And here's the other thing uh, throughout most of the like late seventies into the eighties and the nineties and still into the present, you've got a particular um, model of policing that I can't remember what it's called. Um, I don't want to call it, uh, almost called it public choice, but it's not. It's got like a really boring name that's escaping me now. Um, but basically they use like, like a whole bunch of like targets in the system. And one of the things that they do is they're trying to crush the budget while ra but while setting quotas for like arbitrary quotas for arrests. And so to fulfill the arrest quotas while keeping within the budget, they go after like low level street dealers relentlessly and then they'll catch people for like petty possession and, and so on a lot but they never roll up the they never go they never make like a sustained effort to go after the whole criminal enterprise like you'll see a bit of this uh, like in the wire where you see them focusing on low level busts and not focusing on rolling up the whole system um and then so the wire is imag is looking at how t how actual real police work uh, in, in combating organized crime can get done in that environment and what are its challenges and so on. And David Simon, who wrote that series, was um, he was embedded with the Baltimore Homicide Department for years. And so he wrote extensively about it. And I've got a copy, my, I've got a copy of his book, Homicide, uh, which is about the whole, the story of the Baltimore uh, Homicide Department in the year like 1989, 1990. It's very interesting stuff. So, uh, the Imperial Japanese society of the previous century was guided by a strong cultural identity influenced by Western authoritarianism. This undoubtedly helped Taiwan and Korea clean up their problems. Yes, that is exactly my thesis. Um, uh, but they pioneered a lot of things. They really pioneered uh, weaning people of drugs. We didn't really have much of that in the West. They, The, the Japanese actually taught us how to do it. Uh, so, the, the Japanese are kind of ahead of us here. Um, so they modernized and then they actually innovated on top of the modernization. So a lot of people look to the Far East and see them as just copying, but there's a lot of innovation going on there. Not so much in China. China's very not innovative. Um, in fact, many, in fact, even many of their social control mechanisms are copied from Western big tech. Um, so it's it's really very it's really very strange. Um, has the U.S. state of Washington was it Oregon? Oregon, I think both of them actually they have completely legalized and decriminalized. Uh, I think Washington uh, they did all drugs now. So in Seattle, 
Uh, no, 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 no. You're right. It was Oregon who did who who fully decriminalized everything. Now, if I'm remembering correctly, it was a couple of weeks ago. Um, and um, yeah, it's nuts. You have to wear a mask everywhere, but you can shit on the street and shoot yourself up with heroin anywhere you want. I mean, the de I mean, fucking Americans. West Coast Americans are fucking depraved. I'm sorry. I like it's. It's horrifying what they're doing to their society, and I just I can't understand how it's continuing to be done. Um, no one's objecting, and it's just like it's visible destruction of society. It's unbelievable. Um, tried reading through your drug policy series, enjoying it so far, but struggling to get through part three. Which one is part three? Um, oh yeah, that will have been one of the the, the policy histories. You have done well, Mandrake. Oh uh, yeah. This is more uh, film film quotes and stuff. Uh, cannabis doesn't cause birth defects or disabilities. Look it up. I did look it up, motherfucker. Okay. Alcohol does. Yes, alcohol does. Um, look, you can't say that it doesn't. There's plenty of evidence that it does. If you want to say, is it conclusive that it always causes it or to what extent it's caused? Well, there's disagreement about that in the literature. That's for damn sure. Okay, but that there's no evidence for it? Nonsense. There's plenty of evidence. Uh, Marwani, I would actually like your take on the various constitutions of the world. What works, why it becomes outdated. I tend to see them as mission statements that need revi uh, revision yearly. Yes and no. I think the problem is that you, you're still, if you see states as being independent right now, you're you're uh, you're missing the trick because most most policies are designed at the international scale and they're sort of decided outside of all democratic um and national um institutions and they're imposed top down there really is no democracy anywhere in the world anymore um and no one has any effect um on national policy not for years now uh, especially in the last decade, almost everything is designed by the, almost all major policies are designed by the World Economic Forum and the United Nations, and no one at any level of, of national government has any democracy, and it's all just bullshit. Um, the only countries that can be said to be free, as far as I'm concerned, would probably be in Poland, Russia, and um, and Hungary. Everyone else is just run by the international corporations. Um, and yeah, it's, it's really not good. So, uh, I am not Gandalf says the, it's up to you argument is so stupid. Humans aren't islands. There you go. Humans are not islands. Was national socialist Germany, the first state to outlaw tobacco smoking in public establishments. I actually don't know. I haven't looked that one up. Um, it's possible. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't put it past them. Uh, almost went down that same spiral a few weeks ago. Good thing I didn't go. I don't go out that often. Yeah, no, drinking alcohol's a bugger. Another binging thing. Once I finished high school, my nine was like, "I am free now. Don't tell me what to do." Well, it, yeah, yeah, that's how I was with. That's how I was with a whole bunch of things, really. Drugs, sex, rock and roll. Great when you go to university. Where do you draw the line for the state's ability to be able to dictate what you're able to put in your body or not? Well, I kind of, I'm increasingly thinking that that's a dumb question. Like, okay, not a dumb question. Um, just that it's the wrong framing. So, I mean, where do you draw the line in enforcing any crime? I mean... The thing is, there is no line. What's wrong is wrong. What's right is right. And the, the, the law has to reflect the morality of society. And society is supposed to be moral in an objective sense, which means that, the, look, the only way that you can sustain any morality in society um, is actually by upholding absolute morality. And, you know, even people who claim to be liberal, they hold on to an absolute morality. And that morality is the right to be selfish, really. The right to be selfish within within various parameters. I mean, they, of course, everyone's got their limits. They, uh, but 
Where do you ground your idea of what's right or wrong and what ought to justify laws? That's actually the ultimate question. When people talk about, um, you know, like, oh, where, where should the government draw the line? They're really talking about what's right or wrong, what's permissible and impermissible. And you should really just see it as that. What should you allow? What should you not allow? And how harshly should you punish it? Just strictly look at it in those terms. And then who gets to punish you? And how much? And, and so when you look at it that way, it's not like you can't find one principle that allows that tells you what in society is going to be, uh, what liberties you should have, what liberties you shouldn't have. You're, you're not going to get it. So th it it always results in some kind of daft shite. And if you say like, oh, human rights, well, what the fuck is a human right? Like, which ones are rights? I'm sorry. Like, what really happens is that you get governments basically imp uh, you imposing arbitrary rights that are in the interests of whatever the ruling power structure is. So I, I don't, I don't, I don't see, yeah, that experimenting with drugs, that is wrong. Glad we're on the same page, fella. I have my own philosophy regarding that. It's almost like democratizing the spirit mind. What is this new age nonsense? Devil worship. Uh, I would contend that uh, that the line should be drawn at where things you put in your body creates externalities that hurt others. Yeah, that's that's all intoxicants. I'm afraid. Uh, that's all experimental diets. So yeah. Society benefits in promoting the good health of its members. It does. Is childhood education and the environmental support of structures of the family, school, and community the best way to promote good habits? Yes. But you do need you do need their reassure you do need actually people to enforce it. Um, and those people are called policemen. But what you really want is like the policemen to be embedded in the community and 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 you want to strengthen these ties. But it's very difficult now. You live in the edge of the internet where pretty much anything goes. Um and there's increasing algorithmic control of human belief and behavior and communication, increasing. And so, you know, guarding yourself against what the powerful want you to believe is very difficult now. Um, you can go into your own little echo chambers and so on, but these echo chambers are really steered um, to a great extent and opaquely. It's hard to tell what you're being made to believe. And these things are getting much more sophisticated with time. So figuring out what's right or wrong, you have to try and find a way of believing things outside of the algorithm. And that's very, very difficult. And the best way to do that is to read old shit every now and again and try and believe as weirdly and differently as possible, I guess. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Drugs, I experimented a lot and started way too young. I know a few drugs better and healthier than alcohol. Yeah, but you're just not supposed to do drugs is kind of my position. Um, and, I mean, alcohol, you can... I, I'm not against having a drink or two occasionally, but getting intoxicated. So, like, a glass of wine with supper, a glass of beer with lunch, it's fine. Um, but downing a fucking, yeah, downing a bottle of whiskey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <sighs> Who gets to decide the morality? Well, that is the ultimate question. You've already decided the morality of society. Once you're, the fact that you're asking that question it suggests to me that you think that democracy is the origin of that morality which has a few assumptions embedded into it. It assumes either that it assumes that there's nothing but the uh, limbic desires of the masses that ought to determine what's right or wrong. Now, of course, I don't think that you really believe that when you reflect on it, because you will think that the tyranny, I, I'm assuming if you're a reasonable person, you'll think that the tyranny of the majority is a bad thing. And you don't want to see, let's say, something like what happened in Rwanda where you've got the majority wiping out the minority. So that's no good. So then you go, okay, so then what is actually motivating it? 
Now then you'll say, okay, reason. But the problem with reason is reason is just a descriptive thing. Reason just is a whole bunch of tools of communication. What are you communicating? At its base, the things that define morality are subtle, symbolic, and they're transcendent. They tend to be things that have reference points outside of human behavior. And so when you look at human rights, what founds human rights? It's completely opaque. So really at the end of the day, the, the basis of morality is irrational axia, axioms that are completely non-rational. And you can persuade people that one thing or another is bad by pointing to things and saying, look here, that 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 way of of of, of doing things is bad because you can see it and you're not going to like it. But at the end of the day, it's just about persuasion. And what you should be persuading people to do or not do, that's I mean, when you when you talk about like the ultimate answers, that's really a profound and difficult thing. And some people believe that they, they, they have access to enlightenment, and some people believe they have access to revelation. And I don't think it's very easy to decide what it is. You just have to make a choice. And it's then it's just a choice. And you have to believe it, and it has to be true. Um, and the thing is that you get you get a deformation of the norms of society when those axia are in doubt and the whole point of the enlightenment the enlightenment is is the use of skeptic reason to um to destroy the norms that undergirded christian civilization um and and focus the mind on instrumental uses of human action and reason for the fulfillment of material desire. So that's what the Enlightenment has been about. And the Enlightenment has characterized, um, increasingly characterized different parts of human society. And as the, the instrumentalization of knowledge has continued apace, it has focused its attention on human society and behavioral control. And so now everything becomes boiled down to the interests uh, boiled down to the interests and uh, instruments of an enlightened elite who push you in the direction of the satiation of material desires as they see it themselves and yeah this is it, it's that's that's the way that's the way things are so they talk about like how how you do welfare and how you do all of these things in order to satisfy the human body enough that you know you're not a troublemaker make you a big fat passive freak it doesn't really matter if you're truly happy or spiritually healthy or anything it's just passive easy to move around that's what it's about really um, blah, 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 blah. Are Iran, North Korea, Syria, and Russia out of the orbital influence of the World Economic Forum? Yeah, they are, but Iran, Iran is well. You can't really escape it. I mean, there's 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 pressure on these places, however you put it. But those are those are your big sort of outside places. Uh, China is well within that uh, orbit and it's it's a model that people are trying to extend to the rest of the world um so yeah but the uh, the iranians at least with regards to drug policy the iranians are completely incompetent uh north korea is they make their own meth and they give it to people and they pump meth into neighboring countries so there's a whole thing about Korea. Uh, they call it the North Korea and South Korea. They're, 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 their policy is not the war on drugs. It's the war on red drugs, as in communist meth. Uh, Russia has a massive border that's extremely porous and a lot of extremely nihilistic young people who just want to get fucked up and die. Um, uh, yeah. So differences in culture i guess are a big deal um if you at least as long as you can point to them but one of the big things that i, uh, I one of the things that i picked up on in the essay that i skipped over actually sorry that i skipped over in my 
thesis there was uh, borders are a big deal. So countries with big, big borders generally can't control the influx of drugs. So like the United States is fucked. Uh, China is fucked. Uh, India is fucked. Um, Russia is fucked. The bigger and more. Africa is, would be screwed, except for the fact that everyone's too poor to get high. <laughs> so uh, you, you'll notice that the rich world get high a lot, you know, and then they'll basically the the hedonistic bullshit that's happening in the first world of society destroys the economies of poorer countries. The reason there's so much so many drugs in Cape Town is because that's where all the fucking drugs pass through before they go to Europe. So all of those motherfuckers, they're like, oh, it's my right to do drugs, hey. Those are the people who are destroying the lives of the Cape Tonians by making a, it's just, yeah. Anyway, I, uh, no, no, no. My problem is that who gets to decide the morality? Yeah, we've addressed that um, by saying, oh, I don't know, which is, um, I'm just saying it really hard, and I don't know the answer, except that for me, I'm leaning towards Christ as an answer. That is um, where I'm going. Uh, what I meant is, as the shaman is the sole supply of truth, he takes the mushroom, whereas you give everyone a mushroom, everyone has their own interpretation. I don't think that's really um, the idea that drugs bring enlightenment is bollocks. They do not. I know they don't. Everyone who comes back from the trip tell you they've, oh, it's so enlightening. Wow, you just, but what it really is, is it, it, it gives you the emotional sensation of, of profound, of profound, profound experience, right? But it doesn't actually give you any real information. It's not like you come back with a fucking physics degree. You don't come back with a knowledge of how to treat people better. And if you know people who do psychedelic drugs, you know they don't treat each other that badly, uh, that well either. They just talk about being lovely and wholesome, right? Talk about like leaving it behind, man. Doesn't make you enlightened, doesn't make you wise, doesn't sort your shit out at all. It's no good for you. It's pointless. It's fun but it can fuck you up. And so you're playing with fire and you lie to yourself about why you're doing it why, because that's what your brain will do to you, you know? Harming a human that is part of a social structure is, is an externality. So self-harm is an externality. What? I'm not sure what I said that led you to believe that because I can't remember exactly how I put these things, but I I don't want to talk about externalities. It's like externality. I don't know. I think that's just a bad way of framing it. Um, you have a responsibility to keep yourself together because you you're loved by other people. You, you contribute to society. Society relies on you. And when you fuck out, you, De you you make other people in society depend on you you know it's it, are you paying for your position in the mental hospital in the drug clinic or whatever no likely not you know it's family friends um government and so it's society that's paying for people's fucking retarded decisions in life right and i'm i'm saying this i'm saying this not as someone who's I'm, I'm saying this from experience trust me so this is not just me scorning people who you know other people from like a high like like some fucking high tower sort of of judgment I, you know i've been a fuck up in my life and um i i don't think it's a responsible way to go about things and i think people should be judged for them you know you get points for moving on and getting your shit together but you know you don't don't do that right you know don't do that. It's selfish. Um, and that's that's the way I'm going. Um, self harm is your decision. Well, everything is every is everyone's decision, you know. But is it wrong or is it right? That's the that's the question. Is it wrong or is it right? Um, and people should judge you for doing the wrong thing, and you should judge yourself for doing the wrong thing, and you should praise yourself for doing the right thing, and others for doing the right thing. And you know, if you talk about 
what's good to improve the state of morality in society? Well, enforcing these norms, whether it's by simply telling people don't do that, or whether it's by providing a good example, or whether it's by sometimes punishing people for doing bad things, you've got to decide what's the right thing to do in that moment. Or you have to decide what's the right thing to do as a government. You know, all of these things are actually very, um, they're very simple questions when you come down to it. And talking about whether or not personal autonomy is important, I don't think it is. Not at least, well, it's not unimportant. But my point is, in judging whether something is right or wrong, it's not about whether it's an, an autonomous act or not. It's just about, is that the right act to do or isn't it? Is it good or is it bad? And you ought to be the one who's making the judgment for your, the, you, you will be the one at the end of the day who's making the decision whether or not to do something or not. And you ought to be able to, you ought to be respected enough as an individual, if you're an adult citizen with whose compass mentors, to participate in a discussion about what's right or wrong. Um, but yeah, it's, it's tricky. Is America an absolute democracy? No, no way is it an absolute democracy. Um, I mean, if an absolute democracy is, it's kind of an impossibility. I mean, Karl Marx is actually one of the best people to discuss this in, um, he wrote a really good uh, essay that I rag, rag on about all the time uh, called on Hegel's philosophy of right, where he talks about <clears throat> democracy meaning the erasure of the state by direct continual participation of all citizens on on the decisions of society as pure equals and like this there's no state it's just things are decided by the will of the people and it's very it's all just abstract stuff um and so that would be an absolute democracy uh where the will of the will of the people is expressed spontaneously as a, as a collective organism you can't have that. It just doesn't work. It, it it's just a physical impossibility. You can have um, you can have a tyranny of the majority, which sucks balls. You can have um, a a um, an appeal to the lowest common denominator and the shortest possible time preference, and then uh, you just have a bunch of pigs. But uh, yeah, democracy. Yeah, there should be some democratic input, but. You know, democracy is like this pure essence. Don't pursue that because it'll destroy everything. Um, oh, um, where are we going? Um, malnutrition is also an excellent thing. Oh, I, I don't know. Uh, norm changes but only when people need to come up. Variatis, what can we learn from censorship and prohibition of past civilizations to counter the emerging powers and control ideas in form uh, uh, to control? Emerging powers to control ideas and information in our times. Ipsis verbis Google et al. Sure, but that's a good question. Um, I think at this stage, it depends who you are. As an individual, what can you do? Um, try reading as much stuff as you can, informing yourself. Um, try to stay off social media a bit more i spend too much way too much time on social media myself because social media is algorithmized so it's dominated by algor by algorithms that are specifically designed to control uh beliefs and so i mean they're not always successful really um and people can find what they want if they're really looking for it but it's it, it's sort of that you know the, the, the behavior of the crowd as a crowd when it's moved by these algorithms is it's not natural. And so you really have to sort of go out on your own and find new things. You have to like life experiences or old books or new skills or whatever, and just learn to do stuff and then or learn stuff and then bring, and then bring that into the system. And so the more new stuff or the more neglected stuff you bring into the system, the more you change the system. And so, and the less legible and the more less conforming it is with existing visible understood patterns of belief, the better. So having, having an individual perspective that you come to honestly 
um, of how to live life and how to how to do things. The more the more unique it is, the better it is because it, it doesn't fit into easily manipulated narratives. So you really have to get out there and just be be sincere and and honest about just trying to figure out things for yourself. Like you'll recognize certain patterns if you feel like what is that really? And you go and you figure out, okay, what are people talking about? And think of it like, like the academic enterprise itself. So you look at what people are saying. Okay, you have this narrative and this narrative and this narrative. You go, okay, what are the possible narratives can I create? What other possible narratives can I pursue? Um, um, what is the actual truth? Maybe it is one of the existing narratives, you know, and maybe it just hasn't been um, understood or addressed properly. Who knows? It depends. But we see. Um, is American absolute democracy? No. Dweilen met de kraan open. Mopping with the tap running. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, man, you Dutch people, you're gonna you're gonna get it upcoming. I'm gonna do your country's du uh, drug policy next, hey. I think I think maybe tomorrow I'll do a nice little stream on uh, the, the the Dutch and the Koreans because they have some interesting shit. Uh, the Koreans also very low um, statistics on drug policy. The Dutch very high statistics on drug prevalence, etc. It is obviously evident that manual labor is no longer a fundamental prerequisite for civilization to evolve with limited resources. Should population growth be strictly regulated humanely? Yeah, that's the, the, that is the dichotomy presented by the World Economic Forum. But the reality is that, you know, we can do with more people. And actually, population decline isn't the greatest thing in the world. And of course, you know, a lot of the a lot of the changes that we're seeing, where the workforce becomes redundant, is largely a, uh, an industrial cope. If you, there are plenty of services even the dumbest people can sort of deliver, and the economy doesn't have to be perfectly efficient. But it's an e it's an ecosystem that needs to find its own sort of you know I'm not gonna I don't want to say equilibrium, but its own sort of like pace, you know, its own position and um what's happening is that very very high up you're getting this parasitic um you're getting this parasitic economy that's intervening to um design and change through extremely bizarre means what's going on on the on the, on the ground level and it is very intelligent um but it's not good for people, and I think we can tell that. And um, Variatus, I mean, look, I don't know if Variatus is a transhumanist. He might not be, but he might certainly be entertaining the question, which is, I think it's a fair question. You have to actually think about it. I don't agree. I don't agree with it. Um, I think because a lot of the, the interventions that people are performing are not desirable. I mean, let things. I mean, it's it's not for human beings to decide. That I think I think a question as um, profound as whether or not there are enough human beings or too many is it's just like a, that's a question for nature to decide, or your nature or God, or whatever your nature or nature's God, if you want to get all ganon on it. But it's a general question about whether. Is there, are there enough or too many people? Well, let the system, it will become apparent and it'll sort itself out with time. Um, you're supposed to do best by the people that there are, I think, while they're still around. Um, ooh, I just skipped down a bit, 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 bit. Uh, where we um, depends on the person case by case altruism is possible just available. if eugenics could be practiced in humane and gradual steps should it be enforced by legislation I'm kind of I don't want to touch eugenics really I, I, I stress about it a lot because there's a big temptation there you know 
There is a temptation to design society after one's own, either after one's own image or to to aggrandize humanity and, and reach new heights and things, or maybe to make things function or so on. But I don't know. I think this is this is going into the area era, a sort of arena of playing God. And look, that's a competition that I think the Chinese will uh, will have already entered into. And I think I, I think this is just going to be in the in the nature of things. And what you're going to see is the global elite are going to be performing eugenic uh, gene editing procedures on their children, and they're going to have their children are going to be more beautiful, um, more physically powerful, and more mentally acute than. The rest of us with time and we will be relegated to our positions here in the lower orders you know um and i think whether or not that's good you know righteous for them to do or not is i don't know i don't know if it is um there's certainly arguments to be made in favor but the fact of the matter is that it's it's kind of beyond our control. And I struggle to know whether it's the right thing to do because dogmatically I would say that you know that's not that's not our purview, we, you know, as 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 mortal beings. But if you want to you, you would you would seek to give your offspring the the greatest advantage that you could, wouldn't you? Uh, yeah, that is a bit of a conundrum. Rob, we like you, and you'd make an awesome friend and mentor, but I'd not vote for you to create public policy. <laughs> oh, no. Thanks, man. Um, hey, me, uh, I think that's all anyone can hope for. Closest democratic state, I think one of the European countries. No. I think democracy is a very slippery concept in the concrete. In the abstract, it's very easy to define, but in the concrete, it gets very tricky. Culture is a eugenics problem, says I am not Gandalf. So eugenics is always being practiced, no need for additional fiddling. Now, that is an interesting take. That I think that's actually quite a sound uh, position. That's that, That's a fairly sound position, yeah. Uh, we just need to get the right people in the right places. Yeah, well, isn't that the whole problem of society and politics? Uh, in a nutshell, the individual turns to excesses of his environment, food, drink, intoxicant, sexual pleasure in pursuit of an escape from the negative status of the present. That he does. Um, although, I mean... Anything you do is really to escape the present situation, which, you know, you're trying to change your environment as it exists in the present to achieve a better future. That's just the nature of all human action. Um, Martin says, I agree that drugs are mostly, if not completely negative, but I don't think it's government's place. Really? On what basis could you possibly say that government is not part of law, uh, moral, mor the enforcement of morality? Of course, government's part of the enforcement of morality. You, you know, it, it. You look. If you think that it's better to have a drug-addled society like in Western Europe, or to have a nice, clean society like in Northeast Asia, go with what it is. And as I've demonstrated with the the, the statistics that I pulled up, just just comparing Japan and in in England. It actually comes at less cost in terms of civil liberties because fewer people are jailed at the end of the day. The, the the state is intervening in order to support the moral character of society because it's part of society. These things are not extricable. You know, the state is a separate group of people over there, right? But they're all part of society. You know, they're all they're married to people. They they went to schools. They went to you know. It's not fully extricable. So there's they're interlocking elements. And so saying whether or not the state should do this or not, it's kind of like saying, yeah, I want things to be 
Oh, oh, I want, I, I agree that things are right and wrong, but I don't want to do anything about it, you know? So what do you do in society? How do you consistently, the state is an institutional means for, for with, with many, many purposes. I, I think, what is the way that Gramsci put it? He said that it's a, it was a great quote. So Gramsci said that it is the site for the negotiation of power between elites. Yeah, that's a, I mean, that's a really great way of putting it. You know, it's, and so what you're saying when you're saying, well, let's keep the state away from it is it's, it's, it's letting market forces and blind, you know, yeah, I mean, the, the state has to protect the institutions in society or, or they, or they get eaten up by other powers. The state is, you know, um, you, you, you get in there and you negotiate, you get in there and you negotiate for changes in society Just fucking get in there as much as you can. Um, and it's hard to get into the state. It's hard. You have to increase your standing in society, whether through wealth or um, or by getting or social proximity, so wealth, social proximity, or public standing. And these things get you into the state. Um, and th within the state, you then get part of the negotiation for how shit gets done. Whether you're a bureaucrat or a politician or a lobbyist or a you know or a church, community leader or something. And you get in there and you decide how, and you get involved. And then you ask yourself, so when I'm involved in deciding how things are being done in society, am I going to put help put pressure on people to to do the right thing or am I not? That's really the end of the, that's really the end of that question. And talking about, you say choice is needed for righteousness, but yeah, but we're not atomized individuals. We rely on one another for the strength to make the right decision, you know? Um, you you rely you lean on each other for for that judgment and support positive and negative in order to do the right thing whatever that thing is you know you will rely on friends for good advice not to do bad things you will rely on friends to the, the potential for your friends to punish you through either through physical attacks alienation ostracism um rebuke um, mild dislike, whatever, all of these different things that are part of human behavior, you rely on them to provide these negative reinforcements or the positive reinforcements of praise, adulation, physical contact, sex, exchange of goods, all of that shit. These pressures in society, violent or non-violent, um, coercive or consensual, reinforce behavioral patterns. And what you're doing is you're saying that there should never be any coercion to decide. And I disagree. I think people need to get fucked up. But the thing is that um, there's a limit to it. It needs to be done. Um, it needs to be done proportionally. It needs to be done in a way that everyone understands and recognizes because we recognize rules. We need consistency in society, right? The best way to do these things consistently and fairly is to centrally organize this. Whether, it, whether at a local level or a national level, or whatever the case be, is that suits that community the best, and all communities are different, you understand? So, yeah, I'm going to cut this at half. I'm going to cut this at the two and a half hour mark, and then um, and there's some nice, good questions coming. So, <laughs> cultural eugenics has been surpassed with the capacity of modern-day science. The uberman is closer to reality than before. No, um, yeah, no, this is, this is, uh, this is a whole sort of, um, nationalist niche, Nietzschean thing that I sort of find a bit sort of, yeah. um, they're not going to be ubermenches any more than anyone else is. The funny thing is that you'll find people with limited intelligence exerting themselves out of society, um, every now and again. And the fact of the matter is that you you know those those people are not going to be morally superior; they're just going to be dominant. And what they're going to seek is 
Eventually, they're going to seek control through the use of supercomputers and things like that, and then you will really be screwed um, because at a certain point, there is going to become an AI-driven state, and it will be undefeatable, and it will continue until um, until the uh, society collapses and crumbles into dust, and we e are living in the ashes. But in the meantime, we've got a society to live in. We've got we've got to get up in the morning, and you're not going to give up on life just because the sun will blow up in one day. So life goes on. Um, uh, Portugal decriminalized, did not legalize. Therefore, the state can always prosecute on grounds of sufficient to trade in, which is punishable imprisonment. Yep. Um, we overestimate the power of IQ. Most eugenicists would most likely breed some 150 IQ specimens which would fail at being perfect. I guess. Um, artificial intelligence could eventually help humanity achieve immortality and quasi-divinity. No. Artificial intelligence would be uncontrollable by human beings and would eventually destroy everything. That's the way it's going. You don't, it's, uh, the Great Reset, is that a thing? Yes, it is. It is a publicly stated policy of most world governments and of the World Economic Forum, which sets, uh, which designs most global policies uh, on the economy, as well as the United Nations. So the Great Reset, it's a public policy. It's not like, uh, it's not like some fucking secret conspiracy. It's a publicly stated policy of almost every state on the planet. And um, they also call it the Fourth Industrial Revolution. And it is a move towards totalitarian control of society, and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, you just got to hope that Donald Trump does something spectacular in the United States, or it'll roll on and you will get increasing state control all over society according to centralized uh, policy, which is set at the World Economic Forum in the United Nations. That's it. Um, it's public information. Just Google it. Look at the official websites. Don't even bother with like um, articles by fringe people. It's literally on the website. Go to the World Economic Forum. They describe the Great Reset to you. Look at government partnerships that have been made in the UK, in the Netherlands, in Germany, in the United States, everywhere. The people. Ah, Trump is the only real power standing against the Great Reset. Um, maybe Russia. But, you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, Conway's glider saying most people are okay with the use of drugs. Yep, that's due to a certain um, cultural bias that is enforced on the, the imprinted on the universities by the Social Science Research Council of the United Nations that has determined the trajectory of um, the humanities since the 1970s. And you don't need to draw up a conspiracy for this. They are the institute with the highest prestige because where do universities want to go? Where do they want to send their, their interns to get like the biggest prestige? They want to send them to the United the, the, uh, United Nations. The United Nations has the greatest and most widespread influence and prestige in the world as an institution. And so all universities conform to the prescriptions of the Social Science Research Council for the most part. And those in those their official um, methodology for social science has been critical theory since like 1970 odd. So the move towards the deconstruction of Western social norms has been a global consensus position for a few generations. And that's why the universities are the most degenerate part of society. But it begins in the West, it began before then, um, due to uh, the uh, funding and preferential treatment of a collection of radical German social theorists. Um, uh, most people call them the Frankfurt School, but it's not just the Frankfurt School. There's a couple of other people who are important um, that are really degenerate, but it doesn't matter. The point is that the, the, the trajectory of society from the, has been determined by the universities for 100 years, 
and it will continue to do so. And it's not just the Frankfurt School. There's also the Fabian Society that has run the London School of Economics for a very long time. And so, for example, you'll get a prestigious institution like that. They actually invented modern, um, modern social science in the 1880s. Um, and they will employ people like David Graeber, who's passed away recently from some weird complication of some, some deformed artery. Um, and but he's he's sort of like a, a universalist anarchist type guy and very pretentious makes up a lot of bullshit um uh but very very interesting if you want to get your handle on the kind of ideas that are popular in those circles um yeah we're a cog in the wheel well if you want to be um the, the, it's very messy. The relationship between cause and effect at an individual level is hard to determine. And there's a lot of freedom in the system. You know, even in the most totalitarian systems, there's a lot of freedom in the system. Even a king understands that he can't place his offspring above all of the people. Uh, no, a king understands that he absolutely can and has a biological imperative to do so and always does. Unless he's completely insane. Um, very artists, um, as evolution reaches higher pinnacle of its unit, drug abuse will seem in the future, savage cannibalism is viewed in the present. Yeah, this is, no. It might, it might not. Depends who decides. It depends whether the decision is chosen. Um, and then John Smith will be my last question, then I will say goodnight. So, uh, when you walk through a teleport or atomizer, is it you at the other side? Ha 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 ha. I'd say no. Because if your body is taken apart and you then you're dead. Right? And then th the thing on the other side is, is very much like you, but isn't you. That's my position on the matter, and I think it's very cut and tried. On the drugs thing, says John Smith, do you think that artificial drug effects via neuroscience tech will replace natural highs? I think Globus will use this as a tactic. Yes. If you want to see an interesting thing on this, you must look up, actually, and I'd highly recommend it, look up the, there's a short story by a man called Zero HP Lovecraft. He's also on Twitter, and he's absolutely legendary. Uh, you should look him up. Uh, he did a short story on this where he actually speculated about the use of um, uh, implants to stimulate euphoric, to train them, train the mind, and so on. So, good stuff. Um, yeah, you should check him out. Like he has some really, really interesting, like sci-fi shit about like the dark, nasty future that we're all headed into. But I mean, I think that. I think that I'm I'm not really interested in getting in becoming part of the great machine. I'd rather move to the fringes and live somewhere a little bit more remote. You know, so if I have the if you ever if I ever have the opportunity, I'd go live in the countryside. Um Yeah. Well, I mean that is until Yeah. John Smith, I do follow. That is insightful. Hmm. No, dude, just... Oh, oh, wait, wait. So you are referring to to Zero HP Lovecraft's vibe. Okay. No, then, yeah, no. Yeah. Everyone else, go fucking Google Zero HP Lovecraft. His, his stories are great. He's great on Twitter. He says a lot of interesting shit. Um, yeah, check him out. Um, nighty night night. See you maybe tomorrow. Maybe, maybe not. I'll think about it. See ya.